Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, wa ala rasulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be upon all of you. I hope everyone is doing well out there. Welcome to a little Friday night live stream about how to start homeschooling with our brother, Abdurrahman Ikar, who will be joining us soon, inshallah. You see the thumbnail there, and you see the little meme. See, we know how to meme here. We were not, we're cool, not, we're cool too. We can, we, we can do a meme or two here at Abraham Education. If you homeschool your kids, then they won't fit into society. We have our brother Ikar there saying, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So that's what we're going to get into today, inshallah, brothers and sisters, because uh, there's a huge interest in homeschooling amongst uh, in the Muslim community, even elsewhere as well. And... It's even if you are not going to homeschool, you know, you need to know how to teach your child. Number one, you know, my kids, my kids don't, I don't homeschool. I don't, my kids go to public school. I don't find it too intimidating. Um, but they learn more from me than they do from school. That's how it's supposed to be, even if they go to school. So we'll talk about that. And also, too, I mean, when it comes to advocacy in the public schools, and we have to advocate in the public schools, the, the homeschooling thing is something uh, you need it in your pocket, at least. In your pocket. I started, I got the first video out for a video series I'm doing on parents' rights in education. The, the, the biggest right you have, we well, have a fundamental constitutional right to direct the um, upbringing and education of your child. You have a fundamental constitutional right. But as we'll get into in some of those videos, what does that mean when they are beyond the school doors? That's a little bit of a discussion, let's say, which we'll get into. So keep following the channel. Excuse me. But you also, um, you have the right to not send your kid to public school. You have the right to homeschool them. So, you know, if you can't, uh, you know, you might need to. And actually, I recommend, I, I completely recommend that people do it at some time. You know, there's, there's. So many problems in the public schools, you know, to the extent that as I've tried to kind of educate about on this channel, not even the problems that we mostly talk about are the biggest problems. You know, my biggest concern about kids in the public schools is how little of anything that they're learning. They're just not learning anything. If you are in the state of Minnesota, be sure to go to muslim-parents1.eventbrite.com so you can register for Empowering Muslim Families in the public school system. I spent most of today at a masjid after Juma talking about this topic of advocating the public schools. Alhamdulillah, there's a group of parents here who really want to do that, really have to with some of the things that we found out are going on at their school. But, um, you know, the interest is there. Actually, there's momentum that is there. So that's good. Uh, so register for that if you're in Minnesota. If you're not in Minnesota, send it to someone who's in Minnesota. If you are in Columbus, Ohio, it looks like I'm going to be in Columbus on the final weekend of February, 24th, 26th, doing some events at uh, Masjid Anur in the, I think it's in Hilliard, uh, Hill, Hill, in northwest suburbs there. And inshallah, I will do my uh, educator training program that Saturday out there. If you would like me to come to your local, I'm going to do a parenting, parenting skills workshop, advocacy in the public schools workshop for the Muslim parents out there. If you'd like me to come to your uh, local masjid or masajid, then uh, email me. Let me know. Let them know. Let me know. I'll reach out for them. If you're not, wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. For everyone putting in the salam in the chat, we'd like to see that. Be sure to ask questions as need be. Dear brother, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Michael. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Hey, I never really, good to see you before we get into it. Uh, I never really got your opinion. I, I memed you. You see? I, ah. made, I made a meme of you for the thumbnail. And I never got your, I never got your opinion on it. What do you think? Well, you know, I, I like it. I like it because I would say that out of everybody who has questions about homeschooling, you know, this seems to be like the big 
question, right? Like that big thing that people hesitate about, like yeah. how the kids fit in, you know, are they going to be awkward? Well, um, and, the, and the biggest excuse people make, and, and I do call it an excuse. They say like, well, they won't be socialized. That, that, that is such a, that is really a joke. That is, I'm sure we'll get into it today. Oh, but that, we, is, that whole we, idea that they got to go to school to get social skills, to learn how to get along with others or whatever, that really is just a joke. Most people have somewhat of a traumatic experience mm. with their social life in public school that is best left skip. And kids, they will learn the most as far as their behavior habits from the people they are around the most. Best to be you. Why not? Absolutely. Why you not? know, it's, it, it makes me laugh because I, I mean, I did schooling. I did a lot of schooling. I think mm -hmm. me and you are probably tied in mm -hmm. years of schooling, something close something like to that. 20 years of schooling. Right. And I got to say, especially I'm, I'm you, still schooling. You're still schooling. I'm still not schooling. Not, not not as a student, but I mean, you're I, never, teaching I, I never fully got off that school schedule in life. Nice. Nice. So, you know, you you have all of this experience in school. And for me, I I feel like my social skills, you know, when I was in grade school, just I, I felt very awkward. Right. Oh, yeah. And I was at school, you know, seven, eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. Um the, when I really started to feel more comfortable with my social skills is really when I started working, yeah. right? So, you know, school is not, this is, it's really not one of the purposes of school to make you like better able to um, get along with others. Um, but that's something that we'll get into uh, shortly here. Yeah, inshallah. Yeah. You want to get into it? So brothers and sisters, uh, we got a good number of people here actually happy to have all of you with us. You know, inshallah, uh, our brother Abdurrahman, you know, is mo mostly going to be running the show here today because he does homeschool his kids. I don't homeschool my kids, but as you all know, I know about kids and teaching and all that stuff. So I'll add my tidbits as need be. But I'm sure some of you watching, you know, I know that I have a lot of followers who do homeschool. So a lot of you all have stuff to contribute, this type of thing. Please, we encourage you to put comments, put questions, put whatever in the chat. And we'll be more than happy to, to highlight it and talk about it, inshallah. Absolutely. Jazakallah khair. And once again, Michael, uh, for having me. Um, I just wanted to say for um, those of you who um, uh, are unfamiliar with me, um, yes, I'm a homeschooling parent. Um, as far as a little bit about my background, um, I was born in Somalia. I am Somali. Uh, people have been asking me that uh, lately. I speak Somali. Uh, just not well enough to do a, a presentation in. Um, I lived in Kenya uh, for a little bit in refugee camps there. Um, I went and st I started in kindergarten uh, in Rochester, Minnesota, um, graduated from high school there. I originally wanted to go to medical school, did my bachelor's in biology, um, decided not to go to medical school. Um, I worked as a clinical lab scientist in a hematology lab for about two years realized I didn't like it and my passion was always education because throughout that time I was in college I was teaching Duxi and doing youth work mentorship programs um, throughout that so when I went back to school and, and for, for non-Somalis Duxi is ah Duxi is the Islamic weekend school uh, Somalis spend a lot of time a lot of time at it it really just means uh, school it means madrasa really uh, but we often use it for Islamic education and use is school uh, for school. That's my Somali word. And school. you can see I've put your correct email on the the screen, correct? Um, yes, that is my email. Okay, and your so this is your social media handle on yes, Instagram, and TikTok, and Twitter. Yep. For just just so people know how to um, get a hold of you and tell people too, because I know they are wondering what, where does the name Ikar come from? Yeah, so the name Ikar. Um, that's that's the way it's it's pronounced. It actually, comes from Abu Bakr, right? No so there's a joke that says uh, that uh, when there started to be more Arab uh, migration from the Middle East to Somalia, um, in the north, people took the name Abu Bakr, and then when you go a little bit further south um, in Somalia, people took the name Abu Bakr. They shortened it, and then if you go more south, they shortened it to Awikar or Abikar, and then if you go all the way south, which is where I'm from, all of a sudden they came up with Ikar. So it's just a, a shortening of Abu Bakr. MashaAllah. Masha yeah. 
And look, what would you say? You know, I was at a masjid most of the day today talking mm -hmm. to parents about mm -hmm. school issues today. You know, it did remind me that uh, a lot of parents don't have the capacity to homeschool, period. But, you know, there is like this generate, like, I mean, your mother did not have the capacity to, to mm -hmm. homeschool, but you do, you know, that type of, I actually think a lot of the audience for this and, and our social media audience in general is a little bit younger than us. Mm -hmm. Like, um, they're, they're kind of in that generational shift. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess I don't have a specific question, but kind of what are your thoughts on that? And, and um, yeah, you know, we're starting to see, um, I have a bunch of thoughts on that, really. We're starting to see um, more more and more younger families, right, who, you know, were educated here. Um, I also want to make clear that you don't have to have completed your education here or have a, a background in education um, to homeschool your parents. But um, sure. I don't want to give too much away because that is also one of our uh, big points later on. Sure. Um, oh, and then also as far as uh, after I went back to school, I just wanted to comment a little bit about that just so that you guys know where I'm coming from with, with homeschooling. Um, then I did a master's in teaching English. Um, I worked as a high school teacher uh, for some time. Um, and then I became a university academic advisor, counselor um, for some years as well. And the reason that I mentioned that um, is because I, I want people to know that I've been in the system for a long time and that I've been in it in different ways, right? I've been in it as a student. I've been in it as a teacher. And then I've been in it in higher ed as a lecturer and as a counselor. Um, so my views on homeschooling are shaped by all of these experiences combined uh, together. Um, and I hope in what I'll share today, I hope you guys will have a better picture of our academic system um, uh, in a more comprehensive way, right? Because we oftentimes focus on the struggle I mean, the K through 12 um, sphere and we kind of skip what, what happens in, in college. But all of this is connected as far as our, uh, the reasons why I advocate for homeschooling. Mashallah. Sister asks, when should we ask questions? We'll just put questions in the chat at any time. We'll manage them. It shouldn't get too busy to where I lose track of them or whatever. Whatever. The sister's watching from Loudoun County, Virginia. They say Loudoun County, Virginia has the craziest school board in the country. Crazy. Crazy how so? I, you know, I don't know exactly. I know a lot of the parent. They're, they're like, pa like parents are really, really active in that school mm. district mm -hmm. from both sides. Mm -hmm. So I think they're, so I think that people, end up on the school of bad who are from the politically active factions mm. and they they've had some uh, uh some school board meetings that were um made the news let's say made made the news someone just well, told me the news today is what you're saying michael yes, yes. all right exactly exactly <laughs> do you want to start with benefits of homeschooling you want to start with that i got a banner for each point you send me and everything. Right, that's a great place to start so bismillah okay. Um, I compiled this list, uh, again, you know, looking at my lens, my experience um, in the education system, um, which is pretty thorough, like I've, I've been in it for a long time. Um, and I think the, the first and largest benefit of homeschooling is that it allows us to raise kids with a strong religious and cultural identity that don't have a colonized or an inferiority complex. And this is a really big point. Right, kids who grow up in this education system, they are raised. You know, we're. It's funny. We're we're raising little white supremacists, right? Like who, you know, little ethnocentrists, right? Who think that everything that comes from the West is superior to everything else, and that the West are, you know, they're the ones who came up with everything, right? And this is the kind of this is what they're being fed, right? So they're not raised to think about things uh, from an Islamic lens. Right. So if you take somebody who grew up here, you know, and, and they see another part of the world, um, they're shocked. Right. It's hard for them to to understand uh, uh, people from other parts of the world. Um, they will sometimes take their same mentality and have questions like, why can't they do this? Why can't they do that? And they might even think about that for the immigrant parents listening about your own home country. Right. Where they think that everything uh, there is backwards. And this also has an impact on even how our children view us as parents, right? They view everything from this Western lens. Um, and what goes, what can go out the door with that in the Western education system are, you know, our strong religious identity, um, our feelings, for example, toward elders, you know, how we view family, um, even uh, kids feeling inferior about, uh, about their own cultural traits, about their own language, right? I, I tell parents this story. One time, uh, a kid uh, who I know had uh, 
his parents wanted him to go back home for some time to experience the culture. Um, you know, when he went there, he came, after he came back, uh, the other kids were asking him, they were like, what was it like? And he goes, man, you know, there's just a bunch of fobs there, right? <laughs> That's his perspective, right? That, and for those who don't know, fobs means fresh off the boat. And this makes no sense because how can you be a fob when you're in your own country? Right. Not to mention this is an offensive term um, as well. But it just goes to show you that he has this mentality that even when he is in Somalia, right, that he sees himself as ahead of these people. He sees himself as superior to them and looks down on his own community. Right. And, and what, what you're describing, Sue, if, if parents out there don't know, certainly with the Somali kids, these things you're talking about form the basis for the entire way that they pick on each other at school, mm. in public school. And it's something they do constantly amongst Somali kids, L yep. like the way they, the way they tease one another, all this type of stuff. It yep. is entirely based on the dynamics of exactly what you're talking about. So teasing, I mean, te teasing kids based on the, on the more that they exhibit home yeah. cultural traits, the more likely they are to be picked on. Yeah. And there's, there's a whole hierarchy there, right? Like for example, you know, in the way that they speak, right. Yep. You know, the less there is of an accent, the less likely they're, um, getting made fun of, right? Kids who, you know, speak Somali really well, speak their home language really well, which is a really good thing, right? Um, you know, they are looked down upon, right? And the this is what this Western system creates. And the more the more kids are there, right? The more uh, they are in this environment, the more they have these beliefs. They also start to feel ashamed of even being a Muslim, right? You know, so one thing I, I talk about with the youth that I work with often is that a lot of times they'll know the ruling about something, right? So, you know, parents will always ask, you know, can you tell them the ruling about this, right? Yeah, and we'll yeah. talk about the ruling, but will they have the strength, the iman and the resilience, right? To be at school and say, this is against my religion. You know, you're putting them in a situation where they have to use that phrase often in the school system, right? So I, I ask parents, you know, imagine an average day um, in elementary school, right? You know, perhaps the kid, uh, he's in art class, right? And he's asked to, you know, draw a face, right? Draw a personal portrait, you know? So now you're expecting this young child to say, well, that's against my religion. And then maybe after that goes to gym class, right? And to, uh, let's say for that month, we're working on dancing, right? Now, so now he's in a position where he has to say, this is against my religion, right? Then goes to lunch and let's say they're feeding pepperoni that day. And now they say, this is against my religion, right? And now, then they go to music class and that you're expecting him to say, playing a musical instrument is against my religion. You know, the kid is seeing Islam as restrictive, right? Because the only things that are being presented to them are things that oppose Islam. Yeah. Um, and this is a good point for, for us to pitch uh, Michael's book, um, educating Muslim students in public schools. This is a great- Engaging, engaging Muslim engaging, students. Engaging, yes, engaging Muslim students uh, in public schools, right? Yeah. So this is a great book uh, to give to your teachers, right? To give to your school board. Um, you can also refer uh, folks to uh, Michael's uh, website, Abraham Education, where um, uh, educators can learn more about, well, what is it that Muslims believe, right? And what are how are ways that Muslim students can be accommodated, right? So this is a great way for teachers to know more about our faith. But even if they knew everything about our faith, yeah. right, this kid is still in that environment where they are they are going to doubt themselves, right? You're not exactly building a very resilient uh, uh, child who is proud of being a Muslim in public mm -hmm. schools. In fact, what you're doing is a lot of damage control where you're talking to them before school and saying, hey, you might experience this, you might experience yeah. that. Remember what we talked about? And then after school, having another conversation, as, as we should be if they are going to public school. All right, so what did you learn today? You know, Tell me what your teacher said. Did you experience any issues while you were there? What did you like, right? So now you're, you're constantly trying to unpack the things that they've learned in school. Yeah, it's this huge, um, just barely holding on feeling that parents have all the time is, is, what, is what you have with kids. And, and it strains parents as well. You know, it strains parents as well. And your stress levels. Next point. So the next point is that uh, homeschooling allows us to raise um, kids who are proficient in subjects they need for life and for their akhirah as well. You know, parents are shocked, right? I, I don't have the data off the top of my head. Michael, you do. But, you know, give us a ballpark figure of how many kids, you know, in, in the U.S. Uh, public schools are proficient in reading, reading at grade level. What is it? 
I actually don't know the whole figures off the top of my okay. head, you know, and the, actually the sad thing is that this, this statistic, it's always articulated mm -hmm. um, between white students and students of color. Mm -hmm. That's the way it's always articulated in the public school system. You know, so for, for a lot of times for students of color, it's under 30%, you yep. know, and, and that, that, that's actually probably good for a lot of ways. A lot of suburban districts that are more white kids, it's around 50%. Right. So, well, totally. I mean, you're talking the majority. But they, they, they are not teaching them to read well. The kids who learn to read well in the public schools mm -hmm. are being taught how to read at home. Yep. That, that, that's, how, that's how it goes. Absolutely. So, I mean, look at that, right? We're talking half or the majority of them are not proficient in reading, are not proficient in math, right? So they're not becoming proficient in the subjects that they need to be proficient in to be successful in life, um, let alone, you know, they're also learning, uh, they're also losing their akhira perspective while they're at school because everything is brought to them from the lens of the dunya, mm -hmm. right? Everything is brought to them from the lens of the dunya. You know, for example, um, let's say they're in a science class and they're learning about, uh, you know, uh, they're learning about the process, uh, the stages of uh, development, right, in a person, right? You know, they, they're they seeing this from a secular lens. They're not seeing this from the way that a Muslim would approach this, right, as far as this being something that Allah subhanahu that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? This is part of Allah testing us, right? So they're not seeing things from that Muslim lens and they're losing their identity and they're also uh, losing the, the skills and really, you know, so, spending so much time in this place that is not helping them in their akhirah. And what's bigger than that? Right. What does it do for us as parents if our child becomes a physician or an engineer and they don't pray? You know, what what success do we get from that? Right. Absolutely nothing. We gain nothing from that. All our hard work, you know, going down the drain. They don't need, they might not even make dua for you. And I'm, I'm not saying this as a fear tactic of your kids go to public school. They'll become non-Muslims. Right. But what I am saying is that the public school is bad for your iman as a Muslim. It's bad for your faith. So let's, um, you know, go kind of quickly through the benefits and get to what homeschooling looks like, because, you know, people, they they know this stuff a lot. We, we, we've told we tell them over and over, protect kids from harmful ideologies and harmful settings. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of hype around uh, the LGBT issue. Um, but really, you know, again, it's secularism in general that's being taught. And the LGBT issue is just uh, just one strand from that. Um, it's, it's, it, all, all that is is the thing that puts people over the edge. It just hit that just hits people in the gut to where they feel like now they have to do something. Yep. There's really worse things before that. You know, yes. I, and I talk about in my book. There's common assignments that kids do in the public schools that are shirk, mm -hmm. straight up shirk. They have them do. Uh, allows kids to see everything through an Islamic lens. Yep, and we mentioned that already. Right. Yep. Give kids Muslim role models. So this is another big thing is that even if the um, schools, you know, didn't teach anything that oppose Islam, we still have an issue with our kids, you know, young impressionable kids not having Muslim role models that they're interacting with for that long period of time. And yes, you know, we advocate for Muslims to go into education, right? But at the same time, you know, we're not in a situation right now where the majority of educators are Muslim. In fact, even in our Charter schools that might have 99% Muslim students, yeah. right? Even there, then it's not, you know, it's not common that the majority of the teachers are Muslim, right? Yeah. So this has a Probably huge out. impact. And when you homeschool, right, you being the main educator, the primary educator, your child is seeing you as a role model rather than someone who has a completely different value system. And look, kids just in general, they're deeply concerned with whoever they are around. You know, that's part of how peer pressure develops. Just they have to be, you know, six, seven hours. It feels so long to kids. So they have mm -hmm. to be around them. They want to feel successful in that social environment. And it's a toxic social environment. Better they spend that time with you. Allows kids, to, allows kids to love Islam rather than only see Islam. We've talked about that. Or they're saying it's destructive. Protect kids from discrimination, bullying, dehumanization, and legal issues. Say a little more about yeah. that. Yeah. So, you know, our uh, immigrant kids do uh, at times experience discrimination in schools. You know, they're oftentimes pooled as just one group. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I can think of my own experiences um, in school getting in trouble for things I did not do. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you an example. I was put in a violence prevention program, mm -hmm. not because I was violent, but because I was a young Somali male. Right. Automatic. Right. Put in this uh, viewing myself as inherently violent. Right. So, 
you know, there's these issues that we face, getting in trouble for things that I saw white kids not getting in trouble uh, for, you know, issues of bullying. Uh, Just being, the other day, I got an inquiry from a parent at a middle school in Minnesota where they've taken all the Somali kids from a class and put them in a, uh, a self-control class oh. like a oh. just the just the somali kids just the somali. Teaching about self-control oh, this type of thing that is wow wow well, still going that, on plenty that is straight up offensive look at that yeah. um and then you know i say legal issues because i i remember um a lot of my friends because they had gotten into a fight at school all of a sudden they have a probation officer the charges were pressed against them these things happen right where we're seen as uh, violent Right. So even if there's a little scuffle, all of a sudden you get into you get into a lot of trouble. Right. And it becomes easy for other kids to get you into trouble. Um, and just the simple fact of the some of these white teachers not believing you. Right. I remember instances where I had an issue with a white student and the teacher just takes the white student's side. Right. And this, you know, this is something that that does happen. You know, if you talk to a lot of um, young people from different backgrounds, uh, you'll see that they've experienced instances like these. And it's really dehumanizing. We don't want to put our kids in that type of environment. Now, somebody's going to say, but hey, isn't that just showing them the real world? Okay. Do you want to show them that in elementary school? Right? Like, do you want to, you know, bully your own kids, right? And be like, just preparing them for the real world, right? That that doesn't make sense, right? So we Yeah, can that whole angle too, it kind of has this thing as if that's the only way to prepare them for the real yeah. world. And it's really, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's an artificial environment school. It is, you know, it, like it you is. will face people who are difficult to mm -hmm. deal with this type of stuff, mm -hmm. but you know, there's, there's other ways to prepare them to do that. Absolutely. And I think with the next point, bonding with their children, you mentioned that, but yeah. you, you know, you're with your children, you're seeing what they're good at, what they're not good at. You're really strengthening your relationship. And you know, as we've mentioned in other live streams, your children will not remember the money you spent on them. They're not going to remember you working hard for them. <laughs> when they grow up, they're going to remember the time that you spent with them. Yeah. That's what they're going to remember. That's what makes an impact later on. And that's those. That's what you can fall back on later when they go through issues, right? You can fall back on that relationship. You can, you know, that relationship is what allows you to communicate later when your child is having some sort of trouble. And I just want to say, you know, I know a lot of parents, um, they're hesitant to homeschool a lot of times just out of their own insecurity and doubts. And I, I do believe that for any child, their parent is the person who has the most potential to be their best teacher because that, that child is like is a part of you mm -hmm. and, and, and a part of your spouse or, 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 or their other parents. And you will be able to perceive things about them always, understand things about them always at a deeper level than other people will be able to. So that type of insecurity and thought process that prevents someone from giving their time to their child like this, you know, I advise people that you owe it yourself to relieve yourself from that. And you're not going to be perfect at anything you try to do right away. And, and this homeschooling thing, it is a growing process. And it's a chance for you to grow with your child along with it. So, so you shouldn't, you know, perfectionist thinking, I think is something that can really be damaging. And, and uh, I advise people to let go of that. Absolutely. Um, the, the other points were um, that uh, you teach children how to interact with good manners. Um, you know, this issue of uh, they need to socialize with kids their age. Actually, a lot of what they're picking up from yeah. kids their age are, are bad manners in, in the school system, right? Yeah. You can put them in, you can try to have them in environments where, you know, they're growing up around kids with similar values. You know, you can make sure that they have a social life with adults, right? Because that's where socialization is very important. Kids who communicate well with adults. After yeah. all, majority of your life, for most people, you're going to be an adult, not a kid, right? Um, I talk with so many parents, you know, who are having issues with their kids being more mature <laughs> before they start school at the age of five yep. and then all of a sudden they go to school and they're just immature and you yeah. know the boys are making just constant joke after joke about farting and pooping and it's because they're reading these books you know captain underpants and whatnot that don't have your kids read that but anyway you know this is what the schools are often introducing um to them with the guys of well they're reading they're reading they're reading that's what's important Right. So the, they learn how to interact with adults. They learn how to interact with better manners, with the manners that you show them. Yeah. And the media culture of America, the way it conditions kids in conjunction with the public school system and the, the, 
social culture of it. It conditions kids to be antagonistic towards their parents when they're adolescents. Like mm. that, 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 that is the predictable byproduct of it. And, and keeping your kids away from there and having them around you more, as long as I say, especially from ages uh, fourth grade to eighth grade, though you should start before that because by fourth grade, they might not want to homeschool. That is the best way that you can mitigate that Absolutely. by far, by far. And, you know, to, um, to add to that, uh, the, the Western education system um, also makes assertive parenting look like a bad thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, kids are taught that liberal, laissez-faire, do whatever you want parenting is the good mm -hmm. type of parenting. So, mm -hmm. you know, kids are growing up to hate their parents because their parents have boundaries of what they can do and what they can't. And, you know, it is so common in the middle school ages, especially like up through ninth grade, for kids to to competitively talk about how much they disobey their parents and yep. how much their parents don't have control over them. And the kids who get social power and status in the school, they talk that way. Um, they, they talk that way very big. And they're mm -hmm. usually the kids for whom that, that's true. And, and, you know, especially a lot of kids who like they only have one parent in the household, this type of thing. And, and their parents generally don't have a whole lot of control over them. They are the ones who will adopt like these brazen types of personalities and behavior habits that draw a lot of attention to them and have a really toxic influence on the social culture of kids. But that's the socialization that, that we're talking about. That's, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's the socialization that people are advocating for. And yeah. I remember what you're describing very vividly. Yeah. Uh, kids bragging about what they did and mm -hmm. uh, the lack of supervision that they have. Mm -hmm. yes. So what does homeschooling look like? Well, homeschooling, it looks however you want it to look, right? That's the easy answer. But it is it, homeschooling is schooling that is parent led, right? Uh, where the parent is in control over what the child is being taught. And it's also customized to fit the individual child's needs, right? So as long as you're meeting your state requirements, and we'll talk about that later on, um, homeschooling is, is whatever you want it to be. Right, because you can meet your state. You'll you'll see that state requirements. Of course, they differ by um, the state, but the, generally they're pretty in in the U.S. They're pretty relaxed, right? When it comes to state uh, requirements, um, you know, it's we're not. For example, in Sweden, I I think you're not even allowed to homeschool, right? So you know, this is uh, this is Ger Ger Germany for sure. You know, Germany as well. All right, yep. so you're not even allowed to homeschool in these countries, right? Yep. Um, and you know. Uh, and this point goes to a lot of immigrant parents is that we often think about um, uh, we often think of, uh, about the education system being in order to learn skills or in order to prepare for a career. Um, however, that's not all the education system here is. The education system is also meant to indoctrinate. Yeah. It's also meant to have a system where people all have the same values. Yeah. So there's many, many different types of homeschooling. Um, but the beauty of this, as you mentioned earlier, Michael, is that no one loves and cares for your child the way that you do. There's no one on this earth who loves your child the way that you do. And it's up to you, right, to decide what is best for your child. And you have more control over that as a homeschooler. So I don't want to overwhelm you with all these different types of uh, homeschooling. Um, but what what is nice is if we go over, you know, just look at some of the requirements in general. We can look at the state of Minnesota. Um, or if you have another suggestion. Um, now go ahead, talk about Minnesota, and then I'll talk about what I know and a resource that I have. Absolutely. So, <laughs> you know, and look, the thing is, the state requirements is a big thing because the, knowing this gets a lot of people over the fear hump, in, 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 my, in my opinion. Like, yeah. like, a, like a, big, a big thing, there's a lot of fear in the Muslim community about like having your kids taken from you yeah. and this type of stuff by Child Protective Services or whatever. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, if you've had your kid in public school and they've been you know, absent for a few days and maybe you didn't call in mm -hmm. or something, you get calls from the school like, hey, where are you? Sometimes they will threaten you over truancy laws and all this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that makes people think like, well, if I homeschool my kid, like something's going to happen if I'm not reporting this type of yeah. thing. But that's um, it's really not like that so much. So go ahead. What are the requirements in Minnesota? And we'll go through there. That's funny because it's actually you're more likely to have issues with that if your kids are going to public school. Correct. Right? Correct. And that, that's the point. A lot of that, those truancy laws and stuff, mm -hmm. they're only triggered by the fact that you sent your kid to public school in the first place. Absolutely. You have a right to not send your kid to public school that is absolute in the United States and well-established in U.S. case law. I have a video on it posted already. Mm -hmm. So if you exercise that right to not send them to public school in the first place, then those truancy laws and things don't apply to you. 
Absolutely. So in, in the state of Minnesota, you know, the first thing that people often think about is, well, how do I, uh, am I required to notify the district? Um, and if so, how do I do that? So with notification, um, it's actually uh, not required to notify um, the school district until October 1st of the first year um, after reaching the age of seven. Right. So if you're this is, starting, this is Minnesota specific, this is specific to Minnesota. Yep. Right. If you're starting homeschooling, right, where your kid has not attended public school yet. Right. You just have to tell the district by October 1st of the first year after your child reached the age of seven and you started homeschooling. So if they reach seven in the middle of the school year. Mm -hmm. Right. And you would just tell them before the next school year. So a big question that comes up is, well, how do you tell the school district? Um, so if you. Um, search uh, your school district, they'll, they will tell you how to tell them specifically. So if you search your school district and homeschooling, some districts, you know, have a, a form that you submit online where you submit the uh, form from MDE, the Minnesota Department of Education. They'll have a specific place for you to submit it. Um, other districts will require you to email the superintendent um, and they'll have the superintendent's uh, email after. But, but, but one thing I'll say about that, too, it, it's almost never the case that's written into law that you have to fill out a specific form. It, it usually says a written notification and a written notification at, at bottom means notification that you wrote. So I mean, it can mean sending an email, sending a letter, and it's usually going to be to the school district. Sometimes it might be to the State Department of Education. Mm -hmm. that, that's what you have to look up. And I'll, I'll share... Um, Brothers and sisters, I put abrahameducation.com backslash parents in the chat. And I have a new button in there that says homeschooling laws. This is a little sloppy, but if you click on this, it will take you to a spreadsheet that has, and you can click on this link and just see the Google Doc spreadsheet. For each state, it has the name of the state homeschooling education law. Then it has a link to the exact language of the law itself. And it has a link to another site that will have a summary of the requirements that you have to do in that law. So that's at Abraham, abrahameducation.com backslash parents. It's in the chat. You can use that as a start to find out what the requirements are. Usually it's, it's written notification, maybe by a date in the year. As you said, sometimes it's within 10 days of when you start or within 30 days of when you start. And it can be at any time. Sometimes it's like that. Sometimes there are laws about record keeping. Sometimes there's laws about um, having to take standardized tests still, mm -hmm. but that's actually only very few. That's only a handful of states, really, what I was looking at. I do know here in Minnesota, the districts will ask you commonly to take the standardized test, but you don't have to. Yeah. Oh, uh, in, in Minnesota, you do have to take a normalized, um, a normed uh, test uh, once per year. Okay. Um, but it's not. It's not. It doesn't have to be the MCA. Yeah, it's actually not the MCA. Um, okay. I don't even think that's one of the um, options. Most people take the Iowa basic skills test, um, but the University of Minnesota um, has a nice uh, resource on that. Um, in our family, we take the Stanford um, uh, the Stanford achievement test, not the SAT that you guys right. know, right? This classic uh, achievement test. Um, and the test is something, honestly, that has very low standards. There's a very low bar as far as what is uh, passing. Um, I was going to also say with the form, the form is not intimidating at all. I know, uh, Michael, you, you mentioned it doesn't have to be the form. You can write it in writing. Um, mm -hmm. Some parents might find it easier to just fill out the uh, form. It really doesn't ask a whole lot of information. Um, the other thing is that you need some sort of verification uh, when it comes to vac vaccinations that you've either vaccinated your child or you don't want to have them vaccinated. If you don't want to have them vaccinated, you know, you take the form to a notary and you just write that you'd rather not have your child vaccinated, that you're against it. That's it. Um, this process is very simple, right? So it is not something that is intimidating at all. Um, and that's the process for um, a student who is going straight to homeschooling, right? So, well, what about if your child is attending public school? A question that comes up is, well, can do you have to wait until the start of a new year to homeschool? Right. Um, so in that case, then within 15 days of withdrawing a child from public school, um, then you fill out that form that you intend to start homeschooling. Um, there's an another form that you then fill out before October 1st of every year. Right. Just saying that you intend to keep homeschooling. 
Um, and all these uh, forms are very easy to find, very simple to fill out. But as, as Michael said, you know, the big thing is that the district knows that you're homeschooling. Um, they also ask in the form, they ask which test you plan to use. Um, the most common test that people use in Minnesota, the Iowa basic schools test, basic skills test, or the Stanford uh, achievement test. Another question that comes up is what if you're moving out of a district? Um, then within 15 days of moving out of a district, if you're still homeschooling, when you move to the new district, you have to now submit it uh, again to the new district by October 1st of the next year. And as we said earlier, in years after that, there's an intent to continue form that you fill out before October 1st of every year. Um, another big question that comes up past notification is, well, are you qualified to homeschool? Like legally, what are the legal requirements for homeschooling? So in Minnesota, and Michael, um, uh, I assume this is the case in most states. I haven't looked at every state, um, but in the states I've looked at so far, if you are a parent, you're allowed to homeschool, regardless of your education. Now, we're, we're going to later the, talk the, about... The, the, right, the right to homeschool your child is a constitutional right, essentially. Okay. So as a parent, regardless of your level of education, you have a right to homeschool, right? Now, in, when we talk more about how to prepare for homeschooling, we'll talk about, hey, what are levels where maybe you're going to need additional support to homeschool, right? But, you know, as Michael said, this is a constitutional right. Um, as a parent, you can homeschool. If it's the parent, you're good to go. Uh, it doesn't mean that you had to have been an educator, your license. It doesn't mean that you even have a high school diploma. But again, we'll talk more, more about that in detail about whether we would recommend based on our own experiences, whether you homeschool or not. Um, which Deba says New York, for example, is very strict with documentation. That's mm -hmm. why I saw too in New York is one of the states mm -hmm. uh, that requires you to still take the state standardized tests. I know California is another one of those as well. And, and you see a general pattern, generally the more liberal the state is, the more they want you in the state school. And, mm -hmm. and it might be the stricter that they're on these things. But again, look at that spreadsheet, brothers and sisters, because that, 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 that can at least be, uh, be a place to get started. And I'd say too, just look at the actual statutes. I made sure to put the link to that in there, the actual text of the actual law, mm -hmm. because um, you know that, that's really the best way to know exactly what is and is not required. Yes, and then there's there's another resource related to that that I'll recommend it uh, later on. Um, there's also, depending on what state you're um, in, sometimes there's requirements of teaching certain subjects. However, that is not as strict as they make it seem. Um, and there's also, uh, let's see here, uh, re requirements for documentation. Again, that is nothing that needs to be complicated. Um, so as far as teaching the subjects, for example, in Minnesota, you have to teach and there's a list of 13 subjects uh, that are listed by the Minnesota Department of Education. Um, you have to teach those subjects sometime before you graduate your child. And as a homeschooling parent, you are the one who graduates um, your child. Now, keep in mind that it does not mean that these subjects have to be taught every year. For example, some parents are like, well, I don't see a need to teach my child government every single year, mm -hmm. right? Um, some parents might say, well, you know, this year we want to take a break from history. Right. Well, that's your choice as a parent. Right. And and I want to say, too, um, I mean, with documentation, Minnesota, mm -hmm. my understanding of it, and it would be this case in, in most states, you keep documentation. You know, I think in Minnesota, there's not really exact specifications of what the documentation has to be. It's really just stuff to show that you are teaching. Yeah. And it's not like you've got to submit it or mail it in or something like that. You, you have it in case you get audited. It's kind of like yeah. taxes. Yeah. And then the amount of people who get audited are, are, are really very, very few. You yeah. Know? It's, it's very unlikely that um, someone is going to uh, come after you, right? Like, oh, you didn't, you know, how come you're not teaching math or, right? It's, uh, again, it's very unlikely. Um, so there's different options as far as testing. Um, the University of Minnesota, if you look up University of Minnesota homeschooling testing, right? Um, you're going to see that they offer some resources for testing. The testing is pretty cheap. Um, it's like $60, $70. Um, in Minnesota, you can also get support. Uh, I know in, in our school district, I don't know if it's for every school district, um, you're eligible for $80 to pay for your homeschooling, right? Now, we'll talk more about resources for homeschooling. It doesn't have to be anything expensive. The test itself does not cost much. It's Each test is 
per year per student is between $50 and $70 if you're in a state that does require testing, uh, like Minnesota. So some people might wonder, well, what if they don't do well on the test? Um, they probably will, because generally homeschooled um, students do better um, than students in public schools. Um, you know, you have a one-to-one -one or, you know, three-to-one student-teacher ratio rather than one teacher in a room with 30, 25, 30 students. Um, and really the biggest thing that is being tested is uh, reading comprehension um, and math skills. Um, I also want to say just in my experience as an educator that uh, one of the most important skills for your students to have is uh, reading comprehension um, and the ability to explain things, both out loud and in writing. So, you know, make sure that that your children right have strong reading comprehension skills that they're able to read um, and understand what it is that they're reading they're able to explain it back to you they're able to write about what they read and i'm going to talk about some resources for that as well um, but my main point in bringing that up is don't be intimidated by the testing or the notification um, some states will say we want you to teach a certain number of hours uh, missouri is like that they want you to teach a certain number of hours per year it's not the level, of, it's not the number of hours in, that they're in public school. It's really nothing intimidating. And the documentation, again, is something that's very light. It's just you showing that you're, you know, it can be as simple as keeping a workbook after the student has completed it, yeah. right? That's all. It doesn't have to be complicated. Yeah, just keeping a journal too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So, Where do you want to go next? Do you want to ask answer some questions or go to the yeah, next let's point? Yeah, some questions and then we can look at prereqs or okay. We still mm -hmm. there. Yeah, we'll get into uh, what you need to know beforehand. Or mm -hmm. Kamir says, "What methods, if any, can I utilize to increase my son's focus with time?" Mm. She says, "Is the lack of focus and restlessness more common in boys and girls in your experience, and is it something that boys lag behind girls but eventually mature out of?" Yes. <laughs> Sure answer, yes. And look, from what I know of, you know, when I look at it and mm -hmm. also in my talks with people, a lot of times people, they have a little easier time homeschooling with girls than boys. Mm -hmm. And there is no doubt girls develop abstract thinking quicker than mm -hmm. boys do. Boys have high needs for physical exploration stuff when they are young. So okay. they are more likely to need to be held, you know, hand by hand, this type of thing. Which you can account so, for when you homeschool. Exactly. Yes, exactly. You know, like, like, like. The public schools are really bad for boys mm -hmm. overall. 75% of teachers are female, 90% in elementary school. And the learning styles are very, uh, you know, in general, female oriented. So, so you know, um, you, you can't get too hung up uh, on your son's lack of focus, Humera. If you've seen my, you know, go to my parenting skills course, because a lot of times breaking things down more, putting in increments, this type of thing can help them feel more success, that type of stuff, you know, but um but yep. that's not something I'd worry too much about from the outset. Yeah, I, I agree. Just breaking it down into increments. That's something we'll talk about later. You know, they don't have to be sitting for 30 minutes. They don't have to be sitting uh, for 30 minutes or an hour at a time. You know, mm -hmm. you can have 15 minutes a day, yeah. 15 minutes a day for that one subject, right? So let's say you teach three subjects a day, you know, five subjects a day, 15 to 20 minutes each subject, right? And, and that's the thing is that you can accommodate different learning styles better. Um, the other thing that I'll just add in my own experience is a, a couple of things really is um, making sure that you're uh, restricting uh, kids screen time. Um, this is huge. Uh, a lot of kids are getting too much screen time. Um, and what's happening is that they're being so overstimulated uh, that it's hard for them to just read a book. It's hard for them to um, or just listen to somebody talk. And then of course, you know, just making sure that they're eating healthy foods right? That they're not eating, you know, sugary, uh, just, they're not just yeah. eating anything and that they're getting enough sleep. Um, there, 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 there's a book called Spark, Umera too, um, that goes over actually an experiment that was done in Naperville, Illinois, where a school, um, they started having, I can't remember, it was all the kids or like a large group of the kids before first hour, they would run a mile in the morning before mm. first hour. And they found like behavior problems went down, concentration went up, test scores went up, all that was a, like that physical activity early in the morning to the point of sweat, to the point of increased heart rate and all this type of stuff. They even had them wear heart rate monitors to get their heart rates up to a certain, certain uh, level. I forgot the author's name, but the book's name is Spark. You know, that, that, that is something that like I wish schools would do as an intervention for essentially all boys. You know, just, just get them worn out in the morning. 
you know, yep. a, a little bit before they go and learn and that physical activity. You know, again, that's the nice thing about homeschooling. You, you, you can structure the day like that. You know, you, uh, you, I don't think it's recommended in homeschooling that you try to mimic school in it. Yes, absolutely. Um, as far as that question, at, at what age should we start teaching reading Quran to kids? We actually did a whole uh, live stream on this. Was it last week? The week before? A couple weeks ago. Yeah. A couple you weeks look ago. on the lives on my channel, you'll see um, how to teach your child the Quran. This is the last live stream we did together. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, let's get into well, let's go into let's go into prerequisites. Mm -hmm. Meaning, what you have to have prepared before you start homeschooling. Yeah. So you know, the first and most important thing is that you have to have a solid mission or why to why you want to homeschool. Um, homeschooling. There's going to be times where it's difficult, right? Um, but for the parents who are capable of homeschooling, I think the I think it's the the benefits outweigh um, uh, you know any any risk that comes with homeschooling or any. I I think in my experience, you know, looking at the public um, school system that homeschooling for the parents who are capable really is the way, but there's going to be times where it gets hard. And what you need to have is you need to have some sort of mission, right? You need to know your big why of why you are homeschooling, something that you can look back at when things get tough, right? And something that you can also make sure that you get the rest of the family on board with. Um, some people, they struggle with um, their spouse maybe not being on, on board. So you need to have your why, right, before you approach your spouse and try to get them on board. Um, and we'll talk more about getting the kids on board. But as far as, you know, you, the guardians of the family, right, making sure they're all on board and that you have a clear mission statement as to why. What is the reason that you are homeschooling? Because if you don't have a solid reason, um, then you're more likely to give up on something. So I think that's the biggest and most important thing. The second thing is that you need to have time. You can't homeschool without time. Um, so a big question is, well, how much time, right? And I would say each situation is different. Again, you know, as Michael had mentioned earlier, you do not need to mimic the public schools, right? If the public schools did great, then it would make more sense to mimic them, right? But they're not doing great. So what's important is that you realize that each child has individual needs. Some kids learn faster than others, um, but in general, you know, you want to be able to have a couple hours per kid, right? So two hours, you know, a, a day. Uh, I would say even if you can start with one hour teaching four different subjects, you know, 15 minutes each time, that's a start and it is something um, that you can see your kid improving on, right? Um, and, you know, I can think of so many examples of parents doing this, you know, even as an adult, right? Look at what you can accomplish in 15 minutes a day that is consistent. You can really accomplish a lot. Um, when you have multiple children, um, then, you know, you can multitask as you teach them. Some subjects you can do together. You don't have to mimic school. Um, and then the last thing, the other thing that I'll say is that homeschoolers in general are able to do more independent learning at a younger age. Right. Because one thing that happens in the public school system is that there is sometimes too much scaffolding to the point where there never is any independent learning. So the kid is always being handheld. Right. And they, they don't practice to perfection to the point where they can do it on their own. So this time will reduce as the child gets older. But Michael, you were saying. Well, I was going to say, um, you know, if I were to restructure public schools and I've told people this, I would make. Um, school 8 30 to 12 30 four days a week tops mm -hmm. that's it like, like kids are in school way way too much mm -hmm. there is so little learning done in schools after lunch in that early afternoon time kids yep. are tired their brains are shot it's a time it's a time where it's actually really natural in your circadian rhythm to take a nap it's mm -hmm. not a good time for concentration so i that that is the thing that is the thing that i would say just to emphasize like you, you need time you need structured time you need consistent time but you don't need to pressure yourself to feel like you got to put in like six, seven hours a day or this yeah. type of learning. If I were doing with my kids, you know, kind of intense academic focus, mm -hmm. I would have two and a half, maybe three and a half hours, you know, within that eight to 12 time frame somewhere. Mm -hmm. Having done a you know, physical activity before it. And then, you know, the afternoon can be spent like to, you know, the way I would do it, maybe rest a little bit in the early afternoon. And then the later afternoon can be spent maintain the house and this type of thing, you know, and maintain the environment. And, you know, the thing is like, you're doing things with your kids still that way. Yeah. And, and I think a big benefit that people get out of homeschooling is just their relationship with their kids in general just becomes mm -hmm. one of the learning. 
Yeah. Um, you know, another thing that is so common nowadays, right? You have so many parents. I had uh, some parents who are listening in now, you know, who are doing remote work, right? And, you know, you have these opportunities, right? When you take a break from work, um, you could even, you know, depending on how, how busy your day is and how you structure it and how your household is set up, which is another thing we'll talk about, um, inshallah, you're able to spend time with your kids and see them throughout the day rather, rather than see them uh, when they're tired. Um, you know, subhanAllah, you reminded me of uh, the school that I was teaching at. Our Most of our disciplinary reports, I remember, were right after lunch, right? So oh, yeah. they want to take a nap, right? That's when we had all the fights. That's yeah. when we had all the altercations, it's, all the write-ups, right? It, it's very common to see a student's uh, uh, report card, A's and B's, periods one, two, three, yep. D's and F's, four, five, six, or this type of thing. It's very common. And... You know, this is it's just is part of uh, the way that we're made, right? Um, even the Prophet Sallallahu made dua for us, Oh Allah, bless my ummah in the early hours of the morning, right? So this mm -hmm. is a great time to to have learning um, take place. So once again, you know, this is not something that has to mimic school, right? And if the schools were doing well, we'd have a reason to copy that model, right? Um, you're going to get to know your kids more and you're going to see what needs that they have. Um, and as we talk about the resources later on, uh, we're also going to see um, that there are certain subjects maybe that you might feel like, ah, I think I want to outsource this one, right? Mm -hmm. And there's ways to do that as well. But we'll get into that later as well. Okay. Inshallah. Okay. Time. Um, so that was time. And then the next thing is a home based on education, books instead of screens. I think that's a great motto. Um, kids and adults will often choose the option that is the most fun, the mm -hmm. most stimulating. Um, you know, uh, and I'm not saying every home has to be like this, but in our home, for example, we don't have a TV. We don't have video games. Um, I think video games would distract me as an adult, right? Mm -hmm. As a dad, someone in their 30s, right? And educate. I think that would distract me, right? So, you know, what do you think about kids who have it? And not only do they have it, but in some homes where it's accessible to them, at all times, right? I mean, that's a that is a test of impulse control that many adults will not pass, and you're putting that on your kid, right? So, as far as setting up your home, if you make, if you set up your home, you know, the area that your kids are at the most to be a place of education, right? And you, there, you know, education can also be fun. It doesn't always have to be fun, but a place, you know, where you have nonfiction books, a place where you have educational games. Then, when your kid gets bored, right? Even, you know, let's say they're done with homeschooling and they're bored, right? The, the option that comes naturally to them is let me read this book for fun. Let me play this educational game for fun, right? Rather than let me stimulate myself with a screen. So the way you set up your household is really important. Start out small. Like, don't think, you know, subhanAllah, right? The, the most beloved deeds to Allah are those that are, that are um, consistent, even if they're small, Right. So start off, you know, with gradual steps. It doesn't have to be that, you know, you have a home makeover. But for some families, maybe that's what works best. Maybe for some families where there's just so much distractions. <laughs> right. Just have a big throwaway party. Right. But make sure everybody's on board with this. Right. Um, and the other thing, and I'm, you know, we're kind of um, alluding to what we'll talk about later as far as getting the kids on board is explain to your kids why you're why you're doing this. Oftentimes we think that kids won't understand when really they do. And they understand better than some adults in, in my experience in education. Um, I've been to your home. Mm -hmm. You don't have, you don't have a huge house. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I, I, I'm sure I know there's families who space is, is yep. a worry, you know? Okay. Like I have to get my kid out of the day a little bit, you know, maybe we're living in an apartment, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we have multiple kids in each bedroom. I mean, what, what would you say to that? You know, uh, we had a brother asked, can you please speak about homeschooling networks and feedback on this network being parents, all homeschooling their children come together for group learning, different parents teach different subjects. So, I mean, I mean, what would you say to, to parents who are concerned about space? You know, you know, let's start there and the kid not getting out and this type of thing. Yeah. So, you know, the first place that I would start is, um, you know, when you look at when you look at space, oftentimes people don't realize how multi-use spaces can be, right? So, you know, you've seen my home now. You haven't come to my previous home where we were homeschooling, where we didn't even have a dining area, right? Mm -hmm. um, but homes, you know, a living room can be so much, right? A living room can be part living room, part, uh, you know, classroom, right? It doesn't have to be that you have to have this huge space. So that's one thing, 
right, is to really question, do you really need all of that space? Once again, you don't need to mimic school. The dining table can be where you learn. We don't even have a dining table, actually. We just learn on the floor and on the couch now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they did it for centuries in Muslim countries. You'll be okay, mm -hmm. right? And then the other thing is, you know, you can take your kids out, right? And this is a, a thing that, you know, we'll talk about with uh, getting the kids on board is that homeschooling does not have to happen all at home, mm -hmm. right? Homeschooling, you know, home is where your parents are, right? So you guys can go out. Homeschooling can be done outside. Homeschooling can be done while traveling. Homeschooling can be done while exploring different Muslim countries, you know, depending on what you can afford and what you're interested in, right? It doesn't have to be something where kids feel cramped up inside. And this can be a huge incentive for kids to spend more time outdoors as well. What do you think about like uh, groups of homeschooling parents getting together, different parents teaching just, you know, and I, I know here, um, you know, in Minnesota, I know of groups mostly mm -hmm. run by Christians yep. where, where they'll get together for socialization, you know, mm -hmm. like once or twice a month or something like this, all their kids will get together and they'll go to a park or something like this. Mm -hmm. So the kids have a friends network, kind of that type of thing. I'm not sure that type of thing is as needed amongst the Muslims just because we have the misadjudge and we, sh we do still have a community, mm -hmm. that type of thing. It's a whole advantage that Muslims have and all this that other people would like to have in the society, but they don't. But what do you think about this idea of um, parents uniting to teach one another kids, one another's so kids? I, and stuff? I think I, you know, I would give the, the same advice to start small um, and work in gradual steps. Um, a lot of times, these groups fail, um, and the reason that they fail um, is because you know you might have a, a parent that moves far away. Um, let's say a parent, uh, you know, was maybe a stay-at-home parent, and then all of a sudden they started working. Things happen a lot of times in these groups because there's all these factors, right? Now, so what works better, right, sometimes is if these parents get together and actually say, all right, we are, you know, they can partner with the message and say, we're going to start an Islamic school, right? Mm -hmm. Parents are hired and they're paid, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes when people are paid to be in a position, it's easier for them to be consistent in it, right? But mm -hmm. with a lot of, you know, these um, uh relying on this too heavily right can be something that sometimes gets you out of homeschooling right sometimes it's better to build consistency with yourself right and then right. say hey let's get more people on board I right? agree with that. other way other times it can just be something that you know everybody's emotional because right now people, folks are emotional right now yeah. they heard the lgbt stuff they heard those special letters in the alphabet and now they are just like we're awake now right and you know everyone is is on this and then you know sometimes move into something too quickly can kick you out of it uh, sooner. So start off small. Maybe it'd be a good idea to just start with one other family or start with your own family, work on building consistency. Um, it doesn't, and, and again, um, you know, another thing to question is the need for it, right? So if you're worried about socialization, you know, learning doesn't always have to happen um, amongst your peers, right? In fact, when you do this, you're, uh, you're in increasing the um, student teacher ratio, right? So it can be, it can actually take more time, sure. right? While let's say learning maybe was two hours a day. Now it might be, you know, this parent now has to dedicate eight hours in a row, right? To teaching. So things I, I think a question like this too, it goes back to, to what you started with about having a mission. You know, if you're going to do this, how does it relate to, to mm. your mission, you know, and your foundation of what you're doing this upon, mm -hmm. you know, homeschooling, you're, you're making a huge, great, noble commitment to your kid, mm -hmm. you know? So, so now you're going to start spreading that commitment thin to other kids and your kid's commitment to you, to other parents, this type of stuff. I mean, what is the reason for that? Like, like, like what is the benefit? And you should be agreed upon with the other parents mm -hmm. of what the reason is and what the benefit of it is. And I don't think it should just be for us to all have less time because it won't amount to that. It won't mm -hmm. amount to that at all. Probably amount to taking more time. Yep. You know, what, 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 what is, there should be an agreed upon benefit, probably agreed upon, you know, conditions for the arrangement, you know, and, and people's and, and, you know, well delineated responsibilities ahead of time, this type of stuff, you know, and at that point, then you're kind of structuring something organizationally, almost like you're building a school again, and maybe mm -hmm. you're sacrificing some of the flexibility that you would have yeah. in home school. Absolutely. So, so, I mean, it could work in some situations, you know, if you have family, you're really close with this type of thing, but it makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it might make sense to do it when the relationship is more transactional, like you said, you know, mm -hmm. but, but I mean, hiring a tutor or someone to teach your kid, that's, that's kind of a different thing. So, yep. so, so th 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 that's my thoughts on that more. 
And I agree. I think um, I think there's a lot of um, you know. I, I, going going back to that point of right now, everyone wants to homeschool, but you don't know who's about about it, as the kids might say, right? right. Like you don't know who's who's for real about and, it. You know? and, and just the other thing I want to say, if you are going to do that, every parent in there should watch my parenting course on my playlists because, like, if you're going to start grouping the kids and have one person be in front of the kids, that person has got to be good with kids. Mm -hmm. They have they have to be. They have to know how to manage a group of kids, dynamics amongst kids. If, you know, if it's more than just one, two, three of them. And, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of times, like, um, in a small group like that, you have three kids or say, and it's the mom of one of the kids teaching, you know, that kid might have a tendency to mm -hmm. act up yep. to, to get their mom's attention mm -hmm. that, that they didn't even realize until they got in this context, you know, that type of thing or whatever. And then other kids start reacting to that. Yeah. You know, is that parent adept and skilled at handling that? And ha do they have the skills of a teacher? Because, mm -hmm. you know, you're forming a class now, you know, so, so, so you need, so you need those skills. Yeah. And, you know, you're losing some of those benefits that, that, you know, going back to looking at your why, right. For example, bonding, getting to know your kids, traveling, all of these things now become more difficult when you add more people, um, even value building. Right. Um, and yes, they're called co-ops um, and there's lots of groups on Facebook. Um, you can look up local groups, um, homeschooling, look up homeschooling in your city and you'll see multiple groups um as in our family what we do is we often use that for you know more of like supplemental socialization you know every once in a while they'll like do a science experiment together um but you know just to give a little bit more context into our group one family in our group decided that they were um, going to uh take their kids to an islamic school um that was uh, not in our city right so now it's like you lose you lost someone right um, and then another family decided they were going to do online schooling, right? So it, it happens so quickly and it happens often. And then next thing you know, now you're like trying to restructure everything for your company. Yeah. Uh, Shakaris, what age did you start homeschooling? Is one years old too young? Ah, so, you know, when we think about, again, when we think about homeschooling, it doesn't have to mimic school. Right. Um, and, you know, we can actually tie this into the other question. Right. Um, as when do you start teaching Quran? You know, and in the Quran stream, you know, how to teach your child Quran. One thing that we talked about was that uh, children can even hear uh, as fetuses in the womb. They, right. they actually can hear, you know, what's going on outside and they benefit from this. Um, you know, even small, small children, uh, they benefit from listening to the Quran. Um, you will see that if you start homeschooling with your older kids, that your younger kids um, will now want to sit down. They will want to have a book in front of them, right? And this is one of the benefits of homeschooling is that the younger ones see the older ones learning and they want to be a part of that, right? Mm -hmm. As far as structured uh, homeschooling, you know, when they're really young, it doesn't have to be anything structured, right? But any learning, you know, can be homeschooling. Right. right. Like just, you know, you playing with your child. Right. This is a form of socializing them. You know, there's learning taking place. So it doesn't have to be you know anything very structured. Um, you know, you can just have, uh, you know, lectures on in the house. Right. And you have a house that's, you know, built on Dean and built on academics. You know, these kids are just kind of passively taking things in and it does have an impact on them as far as actually like sitting down um, with them. Every kid is different. Some kids actually are able to, you know, sit down and repeat things at the age of two. Um, I and mo look, most kids, when they're a few months old, they can sit in your lap and face forward mm -hmm. and, and keep their head up at mm -hmm. some point. At that point, you can start reading books to them. And, and it's, it's yeah. good to do that. And the warmth of your body with reading the book yeah. starts building positive neurological associations with reading. Yes. So, like, like read so reading time with the kids should start that young. You can start doing phonics instruction with kids at, at age three, age four. You can. And actually, they'll like it quite a bit. Yeah. We, we, can, I, recommend, we can recommend some phonics books later, too. Yeah. And I've seen phonics work at two, right? Um, yeah. You know, I, I, and, you know, each kid has a different ability. They don't have to sit down for a, a long time. Um, you know, with, in my own experience, I've seen two-year-olds um, able to memorize Quran. Memorize Fatiha, memorize Surah Al-Nas, memorize the smaller surahs from the Quran. Um, but, be, you know, when you're gentle and you just try these things out, and this is one of the amazing things about homeschooling is that you get to see what your kids are actually capable of. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and look, all this stuff when they're young, whether they're homeschooling or not, you should be mm -hmm. doing this type of stuff, you know. And I'll yeah. emphasize if you're watching this not, mm -hmm. and you're not going to homeschool, 
you still need to make your home a learning environment. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. So books instead of screens. Remember that. Books mm -hmm. instead of screens. Yeah. Prerequisite. Uh, yeah, another prerequisite is having a willing English speaking parent that can stay um, a couple steps ahead of the child. Um, you know, and, you know, we, this is for an English speaking audience, right? Um, you know, that's based in the West, right? So, of course, you know, the language in, you know, the US and Canada and, you know, people who are listening, the language is English, the language of instruction. So, you want them to be able to, um, uh, you want the parent to be able to teach in English. Now, Another benefit of homeschooling, uh, going back to that point that we mentioned about cultural identity, is that it is easier for you to maintain. If you have a heritage language that's not English, it's easier for you to maintain it, right? In fact, um, in uh, previous generations, when Europeans had immigrated to the U.S., language loss took place over the course of three generations, mm -hmm. right? While now with recent immigrants, language loss takes place in the course of one generation. And the reason for this is because of Head Start uh, and Head Start programs being pushed right? And it's presented to us as something always positive, right? But if you if you look up my name, you'll see my research um, on this topic. Um, and you'll see that this is something that has really been detrimental. Uh, when kids lose their heritage language, uh, it also means that they lose their connection to their culture. Um, they lose the... Um, they lose the, the benefits, the neurological benefits of being able to speak two languages. Um, and a lot of times it also results in them losing certain values that you might want your kids to have, their connection with relatives, you know, which goes back to, you know, Islam and being able to maintain a relation, a familial tie. So, um, you know, it, there's a benefit in having, uh, in speaking in different languages to your child. Um, but you want one of the parents to be able to speak English. And, you know, I, and I say this and I mean it, um, a parent who at the bare minimum can just stay a couple steps ahead of the child. Right. And the reason that I say that and people might be like, what are you talking about? But hear, hear me out here. This is the reason why I say that is because when you're homeschooling, when you're educating um, your child, you don't need to know everything that they will ever learn. Yep. You just need to know those next few steps, because mm -hmm. not just the next step by itself. But when you know the next few steps, right, then you'll be better able to determine the best course of action for teaching that one step. So so many parents are so intimidated by this. Right. And in fact, you know, having uh, spaces in your gaps in your education, forgot the term for that slice. What was it? Slice. Yes. Life. Slice. Right. So having gaps in your education because you're a refugee or whatever, this can actually be advantageous. Right. Because then then you learn what really matters. Yeah. Right. Because a lot of um, slight uh, people who are slight who have L limited or interrupted formal education, students yeah. with limited or interrupted formal education. A lot of people who have that later on, they, they still do end up having careers. They still end up going to college. Right. So, you know, what you'll what you'll see is that in some ways and even not being a good student in school. Right. Don't think that that's a prerequisite. It's not. In fact, mm -hmm. not being a good student can actually make you a better educator. Um, later on because you know in the ways that school does not work, right? Okay. So making sure that you're able to stay a couple. And I, I want to say on that, I mm -hmm. taught fourth grade for five years. Mm -hmm. The math at fourth grade is complicated enough that I had to learn it as mm -hmm. I was teaching it. And I would be learning it the day before I was going to teach it a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. And I've co-taught math in high school a lot too. And I was not a great math student growing up. So anytime I've had to teach math, I've had to learn it right before mm -hmm. I was going to teach it. And it has been some of the best teaching I've ever done in my yeah. life is teaching math because mm -hmm. learning it right before I was going to teach it yeah. helped me break it down. It helped me know yeah. the whole process mm -hmm. of teaching it. I've seen so many times too. It's actually a huge problem in high schools that you have teachers in specialized subjects that they love and they know really well and have known really well for a long time. And they've lost a sense of the track that you have to go through in order to, you know, have a process to learn the, the subject matter. Whereas someone who struggles with it or someone who's learned it recently, they have a much stronger thing with that. So, you know, it, it will be yeah. a learning, it will be a learning journey with your kid. And there's, 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 there's pedagogical benefits to that. Yep. Absolutely. You know, if, if uh, being an expert in the subject, right, made you better qualified uh, to teach it, this would mean that, you know, and I, and I can, you know, I remember my undergraduate experience and in graduate school as well, you know, having professors who wrote the textbook that you're using, and they're the absolute worst explainers, 
right? Because that is the level that they're working at, this higher level. They're doing this groundbreaking research, right? And they can't break things down um, in a simpler way. And this is also, I would say, a benefit for you as a homeschooling parent is that you are now learning, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's a, this question goes along well with what we're talking about right now. What are some resources you use for curriculum, Islamic or non-Islamic? Non mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and then that is something that I have saved uh, later on in the presentation. So you did not miss it. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll get to it then. Then. All right. Next prerequisite. Uh, there's one before that, a willing student. A willing student. Okay. Yep. We'll talk so, about willing student. Yeah. So we talked about a willing parent. Well, you need a willing student too. Right. So, you know, as Michael had mentioned earlier, homeschooling works best when you start when children are young. Right. If you think that you're just going to, you know, take your ninth grader, um, you know, out of school, your eighth grader out of school, and now you're going to homeschool them. Right. Uh, this is not a good idea. You want to make sure that you talk with your children and you explain to them why you want to homeschool. And again, don't do the baby talk. I I've seen so many parents do this, you know, where they think it's better if their kids just don't know. Right. You know. Those parents who send their kids back home, right, and they're not talking to them, well, this is the reason why we're doing this, right? All this does is that it breeds mistrust between you and your child, right? So talk to them, hey, this is the reason why we want to do this. Um, and I bring up this point over and over again. Children understand a lot more than you think. They understand a lot more than you think. If there's one, if this is, if they, in my years of being in education, if I were to say, what's one thing? that you want, that I want parents to know, it would be that children understand a lot more than you think, right? They are watching you, right? Children, you'd be surprised. They have ideas on what you're like as a spouse, right? <laughs> they're evaluating your every move, right? Children, their comprehension level, don't assume that it's so dumbed down that you can't explain your why to them, right? Explain your why to them. Homeschooling, yes, it works best when your children are young. Even when they're young, explain to them, you know, this is the reason why we want to homeschool. Right. Um, talk with them, explain to them, you know, how however, however you might think will uh, work towards, you know, their level of understanding. But again, don't underestimate that. Um, and, you know, with this point and other points, I do do consultations with parents if they um, want to meet and talk about a specific situation they have. Um, so I invite you all and you know, I'll share my information later to do that. But as a general rule, get your children on the same level as you, regardless of how young they are. Um, and also share with them some in incentives that a lot of kids enjoy, right? So for example, one incentive can be um, your child, right? Does not need to um, be on a specific schedule, that school schedule, right? And for a lot of kids, this is awesome, right? So for example, um, a few days a week uh, during, the, uh, during the school week, um, our kids sleep in, right? Um, and they sometimes, you know, can stay up late with us and we allow them to do that. It's not like they have this set time, right? They can even, um, you know, some days we have them uh, wake up for budget and then we take a long nap as a family uh, later on in the day. And this works for our family, right? It's also the Sunnah, right? Um, so I, it's going to work for a lot of families, right? So being able to have this more flexible schedule, being able to, you um, depending on your family, you know, being able to stay up late or not having to like get ready for school at this specific uh, time and you're not going to come back until way later on in the day. Um, this can actually be a point of benefit for a lot of kids. Um, another incentive uh, for kids can be field trips, right? Uh, I remember I loved field trips as a kid. Um, my kids love uh, going out and anything can be educational, right? For example, just them going to the masjid with you. You know, they can learn and you can learn the dua for entering the masjid, the dua for leaving the house. You can, you know, pray uh, side by side. They can go to the masjid, right? And this can be an early habit, right, that you can teach your kids when they're young. And I will say, as you know, we mentioned in the mentoring um, live stream, that one of the most impactful things that you can do, especially for boys, is get them connected to the masjid and make that a habit for them. Get them connected to the message because this is going to protect them from a lot of the fitna that they're going to face uh, later on. Um, another incentive is time to focus on their own interests. I strongly believe that many, many kids, the reason they lose interest in school is because they're first forced to learn and focus on subjects that they're not interested in. Right. So, for example, you know, when you're homeschooling, if you see that your child is interested in a specific thing, you can work on that. 
right? For example, I, I've seen in my daughters that they are, they just have like an entrepreneurial spirit. They really like the idea of business, right? So this is something that we give special attention to, you know, and this is something that I see them doing on their own in their play, right? Um, they have a special interest in cooking, right? So they're allowed to try out new recipes uh, and we let our kids cook, even though they're still young, right? And they're able to make meals and they're able to, you know, do things that surprise me. But again, you know, when you don't underestimate your child, as will often uh, be done in the school system, you'll see that they're capable of tremendous things, right? Let's say, for example, um, your child is interested, has a particular interest um, in, you know, building, right? Which, you know, you're going to see a lot of, a lot of boys, right? Have this interest that they love building, playing with Legos, right? Um, this is something that, you know, they can continue doing and you can, you can make this part of their education. And that's something that they can spend time exploring, right? Rather than being like, all right, well, that time is up. Now we're moving on to this, right? Um, another thing is traveling. In fact, you know, some people make traveling a theme in their homeschool. You know, there's an idea of world school, right? Where you travel the world. And this is how kids learn um, history and geography uh, and social, other social studies subjects in person seeing it. So Alhamdulillah, for example, our, our family, we had the opportunity to save up and we, we don't travel a lot. Right? We're not a very wealthy family. Um, and we had the opportunity to go to Egypt. Um, and before we went to Egypt, we studied the story of Musa alayhi salam right? We read it from the Quran together. We read stories about it, right? And then the kids had the opportunity to see the Nile River. This is where Musa alayhi salam was put when he was a child. They had the opportunity to see the pyramids. This is what Fir'aun and his people had built and they were destroyed, right? So they are able to see things from an Islamic lens. They're able to pursue their own interests. And on top of that, they're able to travel and see the world. Kids generally love this. And the last point, a uh, big incentive that kids like as well is that you can make learning fun in a way that they find fun. You know, we all remember that time that we were in school and the teacher was like, I have a fun activity for you guys. And you thought it was like just the boringest thing ever, right? Well, you know, with homeschooling, you can find out what your kids are actually interested in and make it fun for real, real, right? It doesn't have to be this, um, you know, well, most kids find this fun. So you're supposed to as well. Um, and this is really a valuable thing that uh, kids enjoy. It doesn't mean it always has to be fun, right? But, you know, I like to incorporate uh, educational games um, for reviewing concepts, not for learning them initially, but for reviewing them um, as a way of assessment and also seeing what it is that the kids have benefited. Um, another prerequisite is having a healthy relationship hey, with your child. Sorry, brother. I have my, my microphone muted. I just wanted to add something. Because um, mm -hmm. older kids... You know, as you said, it's better to start younger, mm -hmm. certainly under age nine. It will be hard, kids like nine to 14, they're going to have this peer attachments. And that mm -hmm. will be a big reason why they won't want to do it. They won't want to miss the social atmosphere of school, mm -hmm. even though it's toxic. However, they can understand that it's toxic. Yep. They can understand that by explaining it the same way that we've explained yep. it. You know, just explain yep. the kids who are socially dominant, the kids who have the most influence, you know, Usually are the kids who have the most problems. Kids can understand that. And while they're really attached to it, if you point it out to them, they can also understand that they have ongoing stress about the social, the social mm -hmm. situation. And part of their hesitancy will be, you know, the, how, just how do they explain to their friends in the first place the mm -hmm. fact that they're not going to be at school anymore, like the mm -hmm. very next day. Sometimes it's just like those concerns, this type of thing, yeah. you know, and, and they're not thinking about it in a long-term way. You know, with those types of kids – you maybe can be a little bit more forceful in a sense of to say to them, you know, look, I want you to try it for a month, for a month where we, you know, we'll try, you know, just, just, just give, give yourself a break from going to school for a month. You know, we'll learn, uh, you, you know, we'll figure out nice ways to learn all the things that Abdurrahman is saying. And then, you know, after a month, we'll reassess the situation, that type of thing. Okay. And, and that's the thing you can always generally do with kids is yeah. try to make, you know, the initial step in smaller and we'll see how it goes and everything builds gradually after that. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I'll give you an example, right? Like, let's say, um, you know, there's a certain sport uh, that, you know, the child likes, right? I, I remember one of, you know, the best parts of school for me is when we were allowed to play basketball, right? Well, you know, you can make that a regular part of your um, homeschooling, right? Where you don't have to spend time on these other sports. You know, you could just focus on basketball, Right. And they can do projects, you know, that are based on uh, basketball and they can actually spend time playing more time than they would have if they were going to public school. 
right? So, you know, when you talk to your kids like adults, right, and you show them the, the benefits of what they can learn, this is huge. And it can really further your, your relationship with your child. However, if you don't have that healthy relationship now and your child is older, right, it can be really challenging to start homeschooling. So, you know, everyone knows their situation best, um, but it, it, can be, it can be really challenging to, to say the least if your child, you know, is already not listening to you, right? And now you say, well, we're gonna shift to homeschooling. And at the end, inshallah, we'll talk about, you know, some al uh, alternatives that, uh, to homeschooling that some parents have tried that still share, you know, some of the struggles of uh, regular public school, but that do have some benefits as well. And if you have that rocky relationship with your child, parenting course in the playlist. Check it out. <laughs> um, okay, we, we talked about state requirements, right? Talk about state requirements, but just know that you have to know them. Don't start homeschooling without knowing what your state requires. Yeah. Um, another thing, and we'll, you know, I'll share some resources later on, um, but you have to know what your resources are. Um, you know, you don't want to feel like you're in this all alone, that you have no place to turn to, right? Um, so we'll talk about some resources, inshallah, but know your resources. Know that you have them. They exist. Uh, you know, homeschooling has been a thing in America, at least since uh, the 1970s, right? So, you know, there's there's a lot of support when it comes to homeschooling. There's a lot of resources. It's actually overwhelming, the amount of resources that are out there. Yeah. Um, and this is why I, I have a little uh, get started plan that I think will work for a lot of families. Inshallah. Um, I will say about having a plan. Oh, uh, yeah, now we move to having a plan. Now, when it comes to having a plan about homeschooling, know that it doesn't have to be like this very strict schedule, you know, with lesson plans. And in fact, the best teachers typically don't write their lesson plans. Um, this is something that, you know, some teachers really only do when there's going to be some sort of evaluation, right? Um, so it doesn't have to be this very strict schedule, right? But what you do have to do is reflect on your why, right? What is it? that is important for you, for your child to learn, right? And you really have to know that. And you really have to dig deep within yourself and find out what is important that I want my child to learn, right? So it doesn't have to be this very strict schedule, you know, that at every day at 2.15 and at 8.15 and, you know, 9.30, there can be some flexibility there. You can find out what works for you. Um, start with simple routines. That's another very important advice. So in the beginning, especially for a young child, you know, you can make it, so that let's say, you know, for example, you work on reading 15, for 15 minutes a day, you work on uh, math for 15 minutes a day, you know, they work on um, reading Arabic, uh, doing a basic, uh, you find a, a teacher that, you know, they can learn Islamic studies, or you teach them Islamic studies for, you know, this period of 30 minutes, and, you know, they listen to Quran for 15 minutes, and, you know, then you alternate between other subjects, it does not have to be lots of hours, it does not have to be complex. The other thing that I recommend to parents is that um, homeschooling can be overwhelming, once again, in terms of resources. So I actually recommend to parents start with workbooks that, uh, that pr and the reason that I say that is because they provide structure and ease, right? It's really just an easy thing to do, even for you as a parent, you know, to read the instructions in the workbook, right? And then slowly expand to looking at other resources to supplement with, right? Now, you know, Sometimes, in the, I'll tell you the reason why I say this. For example, sometimes parents, you know, they start researching this stuff and they really get into something like Montessori learning. And they're like, all right, everything has to be hands-on now. Everything has to be hands-on, right? No, everything does not have to be hands-on. The other thing is that it takes you a lot longer and it's a lot overwhelming, more overwhelming to set up a hands-on activity than to simply do your work, do a workbook with your child, right? You can write lines on the paper and have your kid count. They will learn how to count. Right. It does not have to be that they have to have these special wooden, wooden, Michael, they have to be wooden. in Montessori. <laughs> I, I don't know if you're aware of that. They can't be plastic. All right. So you don't have to have, you know, this expensive because it's expensive in terms of time, too. Right. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be complicated, um, especially in the beginning. Right. Um, and this can be easier for you to start this way, because I'm going to recommend some resources that I will tell you can seem overwhelming. And the, the reason I show you these resources is so that you can expand to them, not so that you can start with them, all right? The easiest thing is to start with workbooks. And I'll recommend a specific um, type of workbook as well. And I'll say, you know, like with learning, the basis of learning is, is, is language. You know, good learning develops language. It develops vocabulary. 
develops knowledge, develops knowledge of history, you know, and science and math, knowledge of those concrete facts, this type of thing. You know, and homeschooling will give you the opportunity to, to make your relationship with your child language rich. You know, both whether it's whether you're sitting down doing learning or whether you're interacting, doing something mm -hmm. else, this type of thing. And, you know, the chance to use vocabulary and explain vocabulary, all that type of stuff, mm -hmm. and just weaving it into the constancy of your relationship with your child. And when you have, you know, you, you, when you have time with your child where you're not tired, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you'll be able to really cumulatively build a rapport like that. They'll really build on itself. And also, too, you know, someone asked about curriculum. You know, people always ask this question, and I know you're going to talk about some resources mm -hmm. and this type of thing. Um, you know, the thing is, like, you have to ask what is really important to you for the kid to learn mm -hmm. and, and, and start there and have a sense with that. In schools, they make choice. There's not something special about learning continuums that schools choose. Mm -hmm. They make choices. They leave a lot of stuff out. They don't they usually don't make good choices. So you just have so you have to ask yourself, um, you know, what's really important for you to learn about, and start there, and 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 ju and just start explaining things. Just start explaining things, you know, have them read and get them to listen. Absolutely, and you know, when you think about it, uh, going back to what we mentioned earlier, the goal is for them to become independent learners. How do you become an independent learner with listening and reading comprehension, yeah. right? So this is the ultimate skill. If there's one skill that you want to put, you know, all the eggs in, this is it, right? It is listening and reading comprehension. If it, and you know, the, a big problem with the schooling with the schooling system is that you know you have kids who don't even learn how to read. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, you know, going back to the point about making your relationship with your child language rich, um, you know, going back to the point and that meme, you know, about socializing and fitting in. Right. Uh, you know, look at look at the way some kids talk. Right. So, you know, when you put your kid into public school, they're going to talk the way other kids in public school talk. Right. They're going to use the same vocabulary, which is not always bad. Right. But if they're only limited to that vocabulary, is that the socialization? that we're looking for? And the answer is no, right? We want them to be able to use rich vocabulary to be able to build their vocabulary, especially which, you know, me and Michael talked about in, in the previous, um, in the previous live stream is that a lot of teachers do dumb down the way that they talk. Um, and sometimes you actually see them uh, doing that right in front of you. Um, and sometimes they're more likely to do it with students of color where they purposely speak slower so that they can understand, right? And, you know, subhanAllah, this is what our kids are, are dealing with. Yeah. Um, as far as the uh, last uh, point, um, before we talk about resources um, for curriculum and resources in general, is, as, you know, as Muslims, we put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ And when you make a decision, put your trust in Allah. Right. If you believe, right, that you're able to homeschool, then I will tell you that at this point, you know, this is something that you need to take steps toward. Right. Because, you know, the question you have to ask yourself is, would you feel comfortable standing before Allah on the day of judgment and be happy with your decision? If you had the ability to homeschool. Right. And you let them continue uh, attending public school and you knew the harms of that environment. Right. Would you be happy with that question? You know, we're all shepherds and we're all responsible for our flock. So make dua, you know, uh, put your trust in Allah and then trust your process, right? Trust your process because this is not the first time homeschooling has been done, right? There's so many resources that you have. The important thing is that you're consistent. The important thing is your mission and that your steps are consistent. And know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees your efforts. Reflect on your vision and be realistic with what you can accomplish, Right, but have a plan that's based on your vision and make dua um, throughout this process. Are there any qu uh, questions that were related to prereqs um, that are not related to resources? Um, I'd have to go through a little bit to find, so let's get into resources. Okay, so first resource um, that I would recommend um, takes about four hours. Uh, you know, you could do this in one day. This is a lecture series that I recommend to always go back to. And it is titled Pro uh, Prophetic Guidelines for Muslim Parents, for Parents and Educators. And it's by Sheikh Musa Richardson. Uh, may Allah preserve him. He studied in Mecca for about 10 years. 
Um, so this is someone who is uh, very knowledgeable, right? And what he did is he looked at uh, examples from the Quran and Sunnah and um, stories and examples from the Sahaba and looked at what are the core skills or the core considerations that educators and parents need to have, right? It's free, right? It's only four lectures, right? Listen to it. Even if you're not homeschooling, listen to it. I guarantee you that you will benefit, right? Um, I would also recommend that you listen to it with your spouse um, so that, you know, this is something that you guys can check each other on, right? Uh, and this will lead you as well to, you know, going back to that point of putting your trust in Allah and trusting your process, right? Know that these are the core things that you need to have as an educator. That's the first resource that I would recommend. And I, um, I put the link to this in the chat. I'm also going to put um, the document you gave me with the resources listed mm -hmm. and kind of the outline up on abrahameducation.com backslash parents. So you can go there, brothers and sisters, to refer to this as well. Jazakallah khairan. And I, I have a lot that I can add to this, but you know the, this is just about getting started, right? It's not about what you need forever and ever because you know, as you'll see, homeschooling can, it can, there can be just too much information about homeschooling as well. <laughs> That's why it's nice to start off you know, in baby steps, right? These four lectures, right? Because one thing that we need to understand, right, is that we... It, it does that we need to see things as Muslims. We need to see things as parents from an Islamic lens first, because if we don't, right, then how can we expect our own children to? No. Somebody wrote. And, and Musa Richardson, he has a background in education as well. He has a background in education yeah. um, as well. So highly recommend uh, the brothers' um, uh, talks. May Allah reward him. Um, another thing that I recommend is Michael uh, also did a parenting um, course. Uh, that's still available for free. Any dates on when it will no longer be available for free yet? I'm having second thoughts about that. Okay. Just because uh, it, it is, it's starting to get a lot more traction. Nice. nice. And I'm realizing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a more live reach out to people. So I, I have to have it up to keep referring to it. Actually, I'm thinking now I'm going to do a 2.0 next summer, though. Maybe okay. it'll be like a summer yeah. tradition, Parent, the summer parenting awesome. boot camp. You know? Right. So this is how many talks altogether? Was it 12? 11. 11. Okay. So 11, um, 11 lectures, uh, usually one to two hours, right? Yeah. Um, but another, another great resource um, on parenting. Um, another um, resource that I would recommend, this one is meant for teachers, right? But um, I think this is important uh, for parents as well. Um, now, the person who does this, right, he also has another resource for parent, parents. But the reason I recommend doing this one in particular um, is so that I, I think a lot of the points um, in this particular resource, it's called Tools for Teaching by Fred Jones. I, I remember Michael had recommended this to me when I first started teaching. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a great book. Um, and, you know, I think about our big Muslim families, you know, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah, we often have big families, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of points in here, especially about teaching routines, um, just in written form that I think parents would really benefit from. Mm -hmm. it's called Tools and for the book is a very, very easy read. Yep. It's, it's got good illustrations, all this type of stuff. It's written in layman's language. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not all jargony like a lot of academic yep. books for teachers and stuff. Anyone can read it. It's mm -hmm. straight to the point. It's probably the best teaching book ever, in my in my, in my opinion. You know, okay. it's, it's not everything, but it's probably the best one. And, yeah. um, you know, the and I actually met Patrick Jones, the son of Fred Jones, before I, I've, I've been to some sessions with him. And him and his father, they're, they're no nonsense types, okay? There's a lot of fluff and nonsense type people in education. Those two are not. They're straight to the point. They're about accountability. They're about getting kids to learn, all that type of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I want to add is that, uh, again, a lot of parents are intimidated because they're like, oh, you know, I don't have a, I'm not a licensed teacher, right? And, you know, a lot of, you see a lot of parents who get stuck on this point. I don't have a background in education. I will tell you, I learned more about teaching uh, in this program uh, <laughs> than I learned in my master's program about teaching, right? Because I felt like in my master's program, a lot of the focus was on the content that we're teaching and not so much on how to actually deliver it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another homeschooling resource I would recommend is uh, the hslda.org uh, website um, where, you know, if you want to see in video form uh, the requirements for your state, you know, if you find it more easily uh, digestible, you can do that. Um, you can actually just search by state 
right? And it'll show you a map of the US, you know, you click on your state first geography test, just kidding. You can also search your state name. Um, and then, uh, you know, they'll just show you straight up what the requirements are. Um, so that's a nice resource. Um, and then you also have Michael's resource on his website, as far as homeschooling requirements. They do update this website regularly um, and give a lot of uh, additional information um, as well. Um, there's two other books that I would recommend just related to homeschooling. But again, uh, I want to preface this with um, these books can be overwhelming, right? You don't have to like read the book from beginning to end. Just start, start with the workbooks that I'll recommend first and some of the outlines that I'll recommend and then easily work your way into these two books. One of them is Home Learning Year by Year, right? Which is, discusses curriculum and activities that you can do year by year. Now, keep in mind here, right? And, you know, this is another big reason why you know, the first resources that I gave were specifically for Muslim educators is that as a parent, you want to know the basics of your deen before you're, you know, digging into these sources, because you're going to find some un-Islamic things in these resources. You're going to find ways that you can supplement it with Islamic material on your own, right, when you know the basics of your deen. And this isn't just something as a parent, right? This is something we have to, as Muslims, we should know our deen. We should know the basics of our deen. Uh, I think I say this every talk, you know, if you're a Muslim and, you know, you cannot give a presentation right now on the six pillars of Iman, like an actual presentation. You know, we give you the mic and you explain them. You can't, you know, explain right now the five pillars of Islam. You know, you can't right now explain how to pray, right? And the meaning of everything you say in your salah. You can't explain the tashahud right now, right? Then you got some work to do. You got to know the basics of your deen, right? You got to know the basic aqidah, the basic acts of worship um, as a Muslim. Um, and that will allow you to sift through material that you see as well. Um, because there's also Islamic material out there that has issues, right? Where you see that, you know, some non-Muslim beliefs have crept in, right? So even, you know, there or beliefs that are extremist uh, beliefs, which, you know, we, we do see, like working in da'wah, you know, this is something that I see, people have extremist beliefs. And you see these sometimes creep in the curriculum designed by um, certain people. Another book that I would recommend um, is The Well-Trained Mind. Um, I really like this book. Um, you know, Michael made a point about make, having like a language focused um, approach. And that's basically the focus that this book takes. Um, it, uh, it's based on the classical approach, right? So you'll see a lot of like text based, you know, text heavy language, heavy resources recommended. Um, and there's a lot of curricular um, ideas and activities uh, that you'll see in this book as well. Again, it's overwhelming. Start with the workbooks, work your way. Um, up to these uh, more expansive, um, comprehensive resources. And I like the classical style of um, mm -hmm. teaching. I like the form of it quite a bit and the, the trivium or whatever they call it, this type of thing. Like they yeah. have kind of a different approach for, you know, what they call it, grammar school and then, uh, mm -hmm. you know, logic and as, as it goes, this yeah. type of thing. I like it. However, like it, it's based on classical education yeah before the progressive movement of education that happened in the Western world in the United States. And I'm very much against that. So, so, so it is a lot better. However, part of what classical education in the West means, means a heavy focus on Latin, number mm -hmm. one. So I'm sure that book will go into that. It also means a heavy focus on the Greek classics mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, you know, the history of Europe and all this type of stuff, especially the Greek classics and this type of stuff. And of course that stuff is full of shirk. And, you know, to me, like part of the benefit of homeschooling to something about teacher kids in general, I talk about in the parenting course. You want them to understand the Western world and the arc of its history so that they can understand their place in the world and understand their mission and how they relate to the West. But, you know, those classical books they and classical education, they certainly teach more of it as like it's an honored heritage of the Western world and this type of thing. So, you know, you read the Greek classics and, you you know, you're just amazed by the, the, the imagination and all this type of stuff, more of that type of stuff. You know, I, I that, that, that whole type of thing, yeah. you, you can't just follow it from a course on classical education, yeah. to, to, to just piece by piece at all. And if you're well grounded as a Muslim, then you'll yeah. know that. Yeah. And, you know, like, like you said, you'll, you'll know that if you're well-grounded as a Muslim, and then you'll be able to connect that, you know, to what you said, you'll be able to tie that into shift. And that's, you know, one of the issues uh, of the public school system, right, is that, you know, students are learning about what these people worshipped without seeing now the Islamic uh, perspective and what kids, 
you know, need is they need direct instruction to understand that what they did is shirk. You know, believing in multiple gods of Zeus and whatever, all of these different gods that this is shirk. This is something that guarantees a person's place in the hellfire. Um, and when you're homeschooling, you can address it from that perspective rather than this idea of like, oh, it's so beautiful what they did, what they believed, right? Um, so this is something that, um, you know, it, it all goes back to that point of, you know, you need to be well-grounded, not just as a parent, right? Mm -hmm. You need to know your dean no matter what. You know, is the dean, the dean is not just something, right, we inherit, right? Uh, you know, when the, um, when the messengers uh, came to people, um, uh, the people often said, بَلْ نَتَّبِعُ مَا أَلْفَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا No, we're going to follow what our fathers used to follow. مَا وَجَدَنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا In other ayat, right? We're going to follow what we saw our fathers doing, right? This is not how we follow the deen. We follow the deen based on evidence, right? What does this mean? Well, it means you got to learn your deen, right? And this is something that, you know, as a parent, right, before you outsource something, right, now you get to find out, hold up, what do I know about the deen? Hold on, I've been praying. I actually don't know how to pray, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, another benefit of homeschooling is that you learn the gaps that you have in your own education. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and you're more of a constant learner yourself. Yep, absolutely. Um, another resource, uh, you know, and this is for Arabic language, is the Medina Arabic Reader Set. Um, and this is, you know, something that, you know, you can facilitate um, as a parent. Um, there's audios that go along with this as well. Um, so it's something that you guys can listen to together. Um, now, the prerequisite to this would be learning how to read. Um, there's multiple ways that you can learn how to read Arabic. Um, one thing that I would recommend um, is uh, if you are not proficient in Tajweed and pronunciation. Um, and what I mean by that is can someone pro proficient say that you are proficient? If the answer is no, not I went to... You know, Madrasa, I went to Duxi. No, and someone who is proficient, say right now that you are proficient, mm -hmm. then please, uh, this is the subject because it relates to pronunciation, uh, which requires that the students hear correct pronunciation from the outset. From the, Otherwise, they're going to have an incorrect pronunciation themselves. If you're not proficient in this, you know, this is definitely something to outsource. Uh, can you outsource to? Well, then outsource that to me in my own um, Islamic education programs um, where learning is fun. Uh, at times, right? But it's also serious at times. And we have a good balance between that two. And kids build a strong community with other kids where they learn these topics. Um, uh, the link will be somewhere on uh, the description. Um, but, you know, there's other resources as well. There's not just me. Um, there's many other resources that you can use to teach your kid how to um, learn how to read Arabic. And this is something that you can benefit from um, as a parent too. You know, you yourself can enroll in, uh, in classes. However, this particular source, the Medina Arabic Reader Set, is really beautiful in giving an introduction to the Arabic language um, that is used in the Quran and that's used in the Hadith. Um, great for parents as well. Um, it's colorful. There's pictures, right? And the vocabulary is focused on vocabulary that you would run into in the Quran and Hadith. Um, now for Islamic studies, there's a lot of different resources. Um, and, you know, there's some OGs here, some uh, homeschooling legends like TJ homeschooling, uh, Iman, uh, Iman's homeschooling, Salam homeschooling, great Islamic studies workbooks. Um, and then I also teach classes. Um, I put a link to my classes there as well. Um, so many resources, right? Um, you know, that are taking examples from the Quran and the Sunnah that are not just focused on, you know, fun or, you know, that aren't trying to like give this whole, you know, sort of leaning to Islam. Um, but that is, you know, very uh, serious, you know, based on classical works uh, for Islam. I would definitely recommend all of these. And many of them are free as well. Um, for tafsir, um, I would recommend, you know, I, I teach courses on tafsir. Um, if you're looking for books on tafsir as well, um, Duha Institute is a nice um, uh, source uh, where they have um, the tafsir of the Quran, an easily digestible language um, to young people. Um, but that's also not like baby talk at the same time, right? Where kids will still build a vocabulary in English, also build a vocabulary in Arabic, um, and at the same time, they will learn why was this sort of revealed? What is this sort of speaking about? What moral lessons can we take from it? What beliefs do we learn from the surah? Um, and it does it in, in book form. Um, there's also ebooks available. Very nice source as well. Um, and something you'll benefit from, honestly, as a parent as well. Uh, for Islamic history, 
You know, some sources are um, the sealed nectar. Um, this is a very heavy, feed, right? It's very text heavy. It's big, right? Um, definitely more for like, uh, you know, maybe starting, depending on reading level, I would say at least sixth grade reading level. Um, but something that you can read as a parent, right? Um, and, uh, you know, change the language or, you know, read to your children. Uh, you know, a lot of times we, we get kids, you know, into this mentality of we need to read them picture books. You know, no, you don't. You know, you can read them. You can read them text-heavy books, right? And they will benefit um, if they hear words enough. You know, they'll start to make ideas, have ideas about their meanings, um, and you can break down the meaning to them too. Yeah, um, and if you got if you got to go through it slower and yeah. to do more explain, that's okay. And encourage them to ask when you know. Encourage them to look out for something they don't understand or mm -hmm. where they don't know, and encourage them to ask that. You can you can read way more advanced books than people generally do with kids. I, you know, the seal, uh, no, I'm sorry, um, When mm -hmm. the Moon Split mm -hmm. is by the same author as yep. uh, Ar mm -hmm. um The Sealed Nectar. And it's much more accessible. You know, it, it, it is less dense. And I personally absolutely love that that book. Um, so, so that's another suggestion. Yeah. When the Moon Split. And, you know, the other thing that I will say is that sometimes parents have this fear of their kids seeing them struggle. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, them uh, seeing that their parents don't know something, right? You know, that yeah, is actually yeah. very empowering to a child, right? That my yeah. parent does not know something and they're striving to learn it. Like, that's an excellent model that you could show your kids. I mean, that's a subject right there, right? My parent doesn't know something. They're, stri they're striving to learn it, right? Don't, don't be afraid of showing your kids that you're learning. You know, it really is a lifelong journey. Mm -hmm. Another book uh, is Stories of the Prophets, right? You know, so it's important. And I think parents, you know, Muslims need to understand this, that we need to start with Islamic history. Mm -hmm. right? We need to start with Islamic history before any other type of history, right? Yeah. Because Islamic history is history, right? It's history of, you know, the past nation. It's history of, you know, how the world was created, right? You know, the story of Adam and Hawa. This is something that, that we need to learn. And a great source for that is Stories of the Prophets by Ibn Kathir. Um, it's not too text heavy. Um, and then another source that I would recommend, you know, just trying to limit our sources in the meantime. And just k kids love stories, you yeah. know, like, like endearing the kids of the Quran, I think introducing them to the stories. From, I mean, there's a reason, you know, it's the best teaching book that there is. And it, it's heavy on stories. It's heavy on profound metaphors, you know, like uh, that is something that you always want to draw on to. Yeah. And then, um, you know, another uh, very important book, uh, The Three Fundamental Principles. Um, this book is actually, it's based on the three questions that will all be asked in the grade. Who is your Lord? Uh, who is your, what is your religion? Who is your messenger? Right? So it just explains those three things. Um, it's, a, it's an excellent book. Highly recommend for adults and children. Now, some of the resources that I mentioned earlier, like TJ Homeschooling, Salam Homeschooling, Iman Homeschooling, um, they actually do kids' workbooks. Um, on books like the Three Fundamental Principles, um, mm -hmm. they're great and they're free, right? Um, but the books it's themselves by this author, um, a lot of mercy on him, are actually meant to be very simple, right? And they're basically meant to, you know, make a point, have proof from the Quran, proof from the Hadith, and then make another point. It's very simple, right? And they were originally designed to be memorized, which is not something you have to do, uh, but don't underestimate that either. I do see that you have the when the moon split in this sheet here that you put up. Yep. Writing? Uh, for reading um, and writing, uh, one of the first books that I recommend to get started with. And, you know, you could, you could start as early as two or three, right? But again, make reading enjoyable. Don't be forcing your kid to sit through these, you know, go based off of when kids are that young, go based off of what they're ready with, right? Um, this is a great book. It's a, it's a phonics-based approach to reading and writing. Um, and it is excellent. It's basically like if you were to take the Qaida books in Arabic, right, and put it in English, right? That's that's all that is. Um, what I like about it is that it has clear instructions for the parents. It has a script for you to read. So that's I, someone asked in the chat, I just want to show, if you go to abrahameducation.com backslash parents, mm -hmm. there is a button here that says homeschooling resources from ECAR. It will take you to his entire mm -hmm. outline for this today. And then if you scroll down, these resources are here at the bottom. Okay. So I know, we're, I know we're rolling through it kind of quick. Someone asked, but that's how you can get to it. Jazakallah for doing that. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, 
Uh, I would also recommend the Brave Writer program. Um, it's an interesting approach uh, to reading uh, that focuses on kids being able to comfortably tell stories, kids being able to explain. Um, it's a nice program. Uh, I, I do recommend it. Now, there's a lot of conceptual things that you can gain from this um, to just do it on your own without buying uh, the materials that she's selling. Um, but it is, I, I have found that it's a good resource uh, for kids, especially when they're young. Um, as far as the workbooks I recommend, um, as far as like academic workbooks, like reading, writing, math, um, science, um, social studies, uh, you know, again, after having a foundation in your dean yourself, um, I really like the spectrum workbooks. Mm. The reason I like them is that they're very simple and that they explain things before you do them, right? So it's literally like there's a concept, a small explanation, lots of practice. Right. So if you as a parent are like, oh, I don't feel comfortable. Well, you know, you open the workbook. There's a concept. There's an explanation, you know, and you can you know, have your own that, you know, you do. Right. And it's mm. just very simple. You know, they're based on grade level. It's based on the Common Core uh, curriculum. So it's going to help um, kids out with testing. Um, but, you know, these are not the only things that help kids with testing. I, again, the goal is to get kids to be independent learners, to focus on comprehension. Um, whether it's reading com both reading comprehension and listening comprehension so that kids can understand what they're reading and are they able to explain this now, right? Um, and workbooks can be a good start when it comes to that. And you can find ways to supplement that um, through the uh, books that I recommended that provide a lot of different curriculums. Uh, for science, there's this other source that I wanted to just quickly mention called Mystery Science. Um, kids love it. Uh, and the reason they love it is that kids call in, they ask a question, and then there's like an explanation. It could be just like, what is ice? Is ice the same as water? And then, you know, there'll be this nice uh, video explanation. Um, and what I like about um, the people who run this is that kids find the material enjoyable, but it's not too kiddish, right? Mm -hmm. it, they're actually explaining the concepts very well, right? Um, now, of course, you want to make sure you have a basic senior dean, right? There's probably a video here about evolution. I haven't seen it yet because it's not in your face. But, you know, you're going to find homeschooling stuff that, you know, has a Christian approach or a secular approach, right? And you want to make sure that you know the basics of your dean. What if you are unable to homeschool or find a proper Islamic school, brother? So, you know, there's some other things that you can do, right? But know that, you know, you're going to lose some benefits when you do this. Um, a lot of districts have an online option where at least what you're not having is the negative peer influence, but yeah. the same curriculum is still there. Yeah. Same curriculum is still there. The other thing about the online public school is that you're able to hear and, you know, listen in while you're home as a parent to what's being taught. And if there's something you object to, then, you know, you can make that clear to the school, right? I've talked a lot about on my channel about standards-based education and skills-based education mm -hmm. and the, in, the, the ineffectiveness of it and how you know public schools are just too saturated with it. Yeah. From, from what I've seen, a lot of the district um, online programs are trying to transfer that into an online format, and it's just even worse. So yeah. I'd be even more of a skeptic of how good the learning is. With that, I'm not a big fan of those. Persons. The other issue is that there's a lot of screen time, yeah. right? I don't think you want your kids in front of a screen for that many hours a day. Yeah. Right? It just hurts your eyes even. Um, it's also easier to get distracted by um, that type of um, schooling. Um, but, you know, at least they're not getting the negative peer influence of schools. Kids are home, right? You still have some flexibility where, you know, it's not like they are doing back-to-back -back classes, sometimes, depending on which one. Um, but again, you know, the, this big issue of it's still the same curriculum, not taught from an Islamic lens. Um, then there's the issue of charter schools. I have a lot to say about charter schools. Um, but what I do tell parents is that in a lot of um, charter schools uh, that are more uh, built for Muslims, not necessarily built for them, but, you know, they're kind of set up for Muslims to enroll in them. Like, you know, there's Somali charter schools, for example. The advantage that they have is at least your kid is around Muslims, right? However, the issue, again, same curriculum, uh, lots of non-Muslim teachers, right? Um, and, you know, you have really a lot of the same issues. Um, in fact, the level of education I've seen uh, sometimes, at least in some charter schools, can be significantly lower. 
um, your kids can be held to lower behavioral expectations. Another thing that I've seen, another issue as well. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there's, this, there's the topic that some families where they outsource certain subjects to private tutors. So another form of that, you know, could be that like, I'm, I'm, I feel comfortable teaching these subjects and I just don't have the time or the comfort level um, to right now teach math, right? So for math, you know, hiring a private tutor or taking him to a tutoring center, him or her to a tutoring center, doing the same thing for other subjects. Um, you know, some people do this for Islamic studies and I recommend for Quran, if you are not proficient, your, your, your pronunciation is not on point, find a Quran teacher because you want the first thing that they listen to. Um, well, since you're talking about supplemental tutors, I'll plug uprightacademy.com, yep. which um, you can actually just contact me directly at mm -hmm. info at abrahameducation.com if you want to get involved in that. Mm -hmm. That is um, a, a program that where you can connect your kid with um, tutors in the STEM fields generally, but also Quran, Arabic, you know, generally from, from Muslim countries, from well-qualified teachers. Yep. If you know, it's, it's online, but that is a supplementary um, tutoring source that we're trying to build, inshallah. Yep. And then with, with that, they uh, give more one-on-one -on -one time and smaller yeah. group instruction time. So some uh, lots of benefits there. Um, and the reviews are great so far. The reviews come in from parents. Inshallah. So uh, should we go to some questions and comments? You can throw more out too if you if you want, brothers and sisters. There's a fair amount. We've actually had a lot of people in the stream. I know we're going for a long time. I am very tired, so forgive me, brothers and sisters, if I'm a little slow. Uh, our esteemed brother asks, CEO Seth Godin says, school kills dreams and tests should be open notes and teachers should implement flip-style classroom, learning at home and classwork at school. Should Muslim educators follow this? I think I have some vague familiar with that guy, Seth Godin. You know, I've had some talks with some people in the tech field of what they think kids should um, learn. I'm not sure if Seth Godin is tech in particular, but actually a lot of people in the tech field have driven a lot of bad um, methodology in schools. A lot of people in the tech field are driving the progressive type mm -hmm. forms of learning because one, they maybe have read or been told by s supposed experts mm -hmm. at institutions or something who are, are not really good at what they are studying, that it is a good thing to do. Also, too, they suffer from this, well, I, I, you know, we have these tech teams and, uh, you know, we're collaborative and, 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 you know, iterative and all this type of stuff with our work. So we want the kids to be the same way and learn those skills. Like professionals, when they think about their own skills that they execute as professionals, and they say, yeah, those are the skills we need to teach kids. They're not thinking about what built them up to be able yeah. to execute those skills in that field. Mm -hmm. so, so that's just a fundamental problem. You know, um, I mean, tests are not a bad thing. Okay, mm -hmm. As far as testing, whether or not someone has, has learned knowledge, memorizing facts and information is still good. It's, it's as important a thing as ever. You know, yeah, we have all these tools of information we can access right away and all this type of stuff, but you can use those tools better the more information yeah. you have in your mind. So just open notes test is kind of silly. You know, as far as like consuming the direct instruction at home and then the teacher helping you with you with stuff, I mean, sometimes it's just something that sounds fancy. Yeah. Like, you know, different kids have different abilities to do that, mm -hmm. you know, you know, especially if they have language concerns, this type of thing. So, you know, I don't think that that whole thing is necessarily good in, in and of itself, but you could, but you could make it work in ways. You could make it work in ways, you know, and, and this brother who's, he, he's a school teacher. Um, you know, when people try that, the thing they always run into is, okay, you can tell the kids to, to watch a video at home. That's going to be the yeah. learning. And then, yeah, you're going to spend class the next day mm -hmm. um, doing something. Kids get to class, half the class didn't watch yeah. the video that they're supposed to. Yeah. So, so motivation is a huge thing in this. You know, as Abdul Rahman was saying, good homeschooling, it will build kids into independent learners. Yes. And creating a family that is education focused mm -hmm. will build kids into independent learners. And that's the thing we're really going to. You know, for me, brother, as, as a teacher who teaches a lot of kids who aren't necessarily getting that, I try to, Im to impart as much of that as I can upon them, you know, for, for, for my own for my own personality of trying to be, uh, you, you know, 
trying to impart to them to 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 value learning and the richness of it and all this type of thing as much as they can. Mm-hmm. And I don't really do it this way. It's done by teaching them stuff directly. You know that that's how they experience uh, the joy of learning. The other thing that I, I was just going to say is that you know memorization is part of our schol- scholarly tradition as Muslims, right? You know this is like. You know, scholars used to have students memorize the Quran and then they would right, start going into other subjects because the proof oftentimes will have a Quran ayah, like when it comes to fiqh or uh, uh, aqidah, they would have them memorize a, a hadith first. Um, and the beauty of that, you know, and, and I can attest to that is that it stays with you. Like right now I can, you know, you know, give a talk about a topic and mention this, this, that and that ayah from from uh, the Quran, alhamdulillah. Well, the reason why can I do that? It's because I memorized uh, the Quran. And if I didn't do that, then I would now have to, you know, look at all these different sources and spend my time doing that, right? So this is our scholarly tradition. Um, the knowledge is closer to you. You're better able to explain it. And it also builds you up um, for other things. I, I wanted to comment on the flipped uh, classroom thing. Uh, mm-hmm. My experience as a university uh, lecturer at a university where this was like a thing, you know, oh, flipped classroom, right? I just had so many students who were like, we can't do this, right? Because, you know, like Michael said, only half the students uh, actually did it at home. What it, what it really is, I think, is like lazy teaching, where it's like, you know, just oh, have yeah. to teach themselves. A whole, right? a whole lot of the big education trends are excuses yeah. for teachers to be lazy. Absolutely. I mean, this is a good thing, right, for kids to be independent learners, right? Yeah. But then now to like expect it from everybody and then now approach it afterward, I think that's really challenging. Mr. Self asks, what if your spouse supports homeschool for kindergarten through high school, but thinks after that they should continue with college? Do you still homeschool them in that situation? Yeah. So one thing that I would say about that is that, um, and this is a, a topic I, I deal with often, Right, I put on my college counselor hat. Um, is that college is not for everyone? Um, you should go to college uh, if you have, if there's a certain skill set that you're trying to learn um, that requires you to go to college. Right. So oftentimes, for example, in healthcare, you know, you need to have some college. However, the issue that uh, exists is that many colleges actually offer two-year programs or like shorter programs um, to, for example, nursing. Right, where you can actually get a job um, as a nurse. And I will tell you that as a pre-health advisor, most hospitals and clinics are still hiring um, nurses with two-year degrees. However, a lot of young people, they want the experience of going to college, you know, so they get the four-year degree. Um, And the four-year degree leads to a lot of indoctrination. And I will also say indoctrination is even heavier um, in college uh, than it is in high school. So um, college is not for everyone. Um, You know, you need it for healthcare. You need it for teaching. Um, There's a lot of professions where actually you can you don't necessarily need um, college for, and a lot of our young people are being forced to go to college um, when it's actually not the right time and it's not even something they're interested in, where more of them need to be considering the trades, where there's a lot less um, indoctrination, more opportunities for entrepreneurship, um, and more opportunities for the money, right? And we can't ignore that, right? We can't just say, follow your passion, ignore the money. And I'm not sure if it was implied in the question, but th- there's nothing about homeschooling, even if it's all the way through 12th grade, mm-hmm. that is preventative of someone going to college. Yeah, you know, absolutely. All, you know, the, all you have to do is demonstrate the, the learning that they did and all this type of stuff. There's portfolios, mm-hmm. there's essays that can be run. There's all different kinds of ways to do that. Now, if you have a real big goal of that, like mm-hmm. it's a thing for you that you want your kid to get into a really good college and you're homeschool, you might be a little more stringent about how you keep the records of their learning, especially when they're more in the high school uh, ages, but there's nothing preventative about homeschooling. From yeah. uh, you, you don't need a high school transcript to get into to college. You don't, and that's, if, a, that's something they look at. If but, the college uh, says, if the college requires it, um, you can make one. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. If the college requires it, then you know you just <laughs> you make a, a transcript. Took math. You know, give them whatever grade you think they got. Right. <laughs> and you know, look at different subjects. There's templates online. The, the Muslim housewife uh, is asking us, what is the difference between GED and graduating? Good question. So um, some, thing, some uh, parents, what they do is they have, um, they have their homeschool children uh, take the GED exam or do like a GED program so that they get a GED diploma. Um, and some uh, homeschooling parents, what they do um, is that they graduate their child. So you as a homeschooling institution um, can actually graduate your own child. Um, you know, you can print them out a diploma with their name on it. They graduated. Right. Um, and if the college requires um, transcripts, you know, then based on, you know, your very relaxed record keeping, you can come up with a transcript. However, 
one thing that I recommend um, is uh, try to encourage your children, um, especially when they're homeschooled, and even if they're not, to do post-secondary enrollment options programs uh, where they enroll both in college and high school uh, for 11th grade and 12th grade. Um, in some uh, places, they're actually able um, to start as early as 10th grade. Right. And then they would already have college credits before they actually apply to university. The way that works is that every state has one and it's free. Um, and some of the things that they test before that is they test, you know, their reading level, make sure it's appropriate, their math level. They don't need to do every subject. The more subjects, the better. Um, but the reason that I recommend that is that you can you can actually graduate with a two year degree the same time you graduate from high school. So Alhamdulillah, I did that. When I graduated um, high school, I was also graduating with a two-year degree in college. Um, so I already you know, completed all my generals. I highly recommend it for the students who are serious as often homeschooling, um, stu homeschool students are. How do you teach Quran to a child who has speech delays and already has sounds missing from their English speech? Yeah, so you know, one thing that I recommend is nobody knows your, uh, number one is you know, if you're not qualified um, yourself, this is definitely something to outsource. Uh, for to make sure that it's someone who, you know, does have really good pronunciation because you want them to be exposed to the correct pronunciation from the beginning when it comes to Quran, because this is a really important thing. Um, in fact, some scholars took the position that if you mispronounce one letter, one letter of Fatiha, um, that that raka, meaning your salah, does not count, right? So this is something that is actually very serious. Make sure they're studying from someone serious as far as speech or someone qualified. Um, if it's not you, if you're not the one that's qualified, you can always get qualified to have a growth mindset. Um, as far as um, speech delays, I've worked with students who had speech delays. Um, what often helps um, is uh, two things, I would say. One is regularly reading with a reciter. Um, and with res I, I recommend only husari, right? Um, you know, there's some other reciters that I love, but just get them reading with husari regularly, regularly. And I do a video um, uh, on that, but get them reading with husari, listening to husari regularly. Wallahi, I have seen people who stutter when they speak, right? And then because of that constant reading with a slow reading um, and very precise reciter, that they can recite the Quran just fine, even though they have um, other issues. Me, myself, I have a lisp when I talk. I don't have a lisp when I recite the Quran. So you can have, um, you know, even with speech delays, even with some speech impediments, as long as you're consistent with them reading with the reciter, and also having a strong understanding of the basic uh, phonic elements of the Quran um, and just being consistent and patient. Um, inshallah, you'll see regular uh, progress. Um, again, you want to hold a high expectation for them, uh, but also understand uh, where it is that they're at by being consistent. Um, how do you teach subjects like mathematics, physics? How long can you delay these subjects? Any suggestions for kids in the UK? So in the UK, you know, you're, I, I don't know the, the legal issues surrounding the UK, but you can, you know, get very far just by Googling um, as far as legal requirements for homeschooling. As far as math, I would say definitely don't delay math. Um, the important thing about math is that it teaches a lot of other critical thinking skills, like, for example, doing things sequentially, doing things in order, um, explaining, uh, you know, doing smaller steps to lead to a bigger outcome, critical thinking through word problems. Of course, once you master, you know, basic arithmetic, um, so I don't recommend delaying math. Easiest way to get started, get a math workbook. Um, and there's so many um, online. But one that I recommend um, is the Spectrum uh, series. Um, and they can do math um, using that. Uh, for some students, they just really struggle with learning math through reading. Um, there's also math programs um, where they, um, they use more... Um, they use more resources, you know, you get, for example, manipulatives that kids can touch and feel. Um, it doesn't have to be anything complicated, but if you want something that already has a system, uh, Math Mammoth is an example of that. Um, and that's one that is recommended in um, two of the books that we mentioned um, earlier on. I'll say the, the sciences, um, you know, physics, biology, this type of stuff, you know, Actually, too, even with these subjects, as far as when to delay stuff, that's a whole other thing I would say if you homeschool, not to bog yourself down. Mm -hmm. You know, don't pressure yourself like, oh, I didn't do this with them or that, or whatever. You know, you do want, you know, math, the basics of math, phonics, and the basics of reading, that basic mm -hmm. foundation. So, yeah, you want to start with that. You know, there's so much that you can get to. 
yep. and kids will learn quicker as they get older. So, you know, you don't have to stress yourself out about when to do the thing right. I will say generally science, um, you know, learning science in a book, like ordered learning continuum kind of way, that is something that you can delay. I would say like when kids are younger, it's quite all right for science to ex experiments, the science experience to be more doing experiments, you know, maybe fun things in the house or whatever, certainly exploring outside, you know, you want to, you want, huh? Cooking. That's a great way Cook, to get. Kids absolutely. To absolutely. Time. And even following the recipes and the measurements, mm -hmm. all this yep. about math, you know, exploring outside. Okay. Let the kids dig in dirt and this type of stuff, planting stuff, explaining the life cycle, which forms a foundation for sex education as well yep. in, in a wholesome way and, and all this type of stuff, you know, homeschooling will enable you to give kids more of those types of enriching experiences when they're younger, which are, which are really, really good actually. And, you know, I, I think like, like honestly, like nine, 10, 11 is when you can get into like, okay, now we're going to study a biology book and like, mm -hmm. you know, get the terminology, that type of stuff. That, that'd be the one thing I would say about that as far as like physics and biology are concerned. You know, another, science like that. Another thing that I'd say is um, two, two things. Number one is just, you know, always connecting that back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, Allah oh, yeah. created this, connecting it back to the Quran. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable doing that, hey, this is a great opportunity for you to, you know, show a growth mindset and learn it yourself from qualified teachers. Um, the other point that I would recommend is just building curiosity is really important too. Uh, which is like, you know, it's one of those perplexing things for people. How do you build curiosity? Well, ask questions, you know, ask questions to your child. Like, do you ever wonder, right? And the more that you do this, you know, the more they're going to model that. Um, and that's why I think uh, programs like Mystery Science do a really good job of that, of just getting kids wondering, like, hey, how exactly does that work? Um, I And I wanted to say, I just second everything you said, Michael. Um, a big part of the public education system is that there's this, you know, huge attempt to introduce every subject early on. Uh, when the kids didn't even master how to read and comprehend right. it. Um, same thing with math. You know, kids are trying to do word problems and they don't even know. Well, right. one thing though I'd say is they delay history in public schools, though, to a ridiculous degree. Social studies in elementary school is mm -hmm. honestly ridiculous. It's mm -hmm. ridiculous how much non-teaching they do. And they don't teach. In my, they don't. You can te start teaching history very early. Yep. Certainly mm -hmm. by age six. Yep. You know, just by talking to kids. Okay, yep. Just talk, you're talking about the family history. You know, talk, mm -hmm. and talk about the history of Islam. You know, you, you can, the broad way, you know, show kids a map. I, I, you know, my daughters, when they were five, six, I showed them a map of the world, explained the spread of Islam, you know, how it didn't reach Europe, how we got to this part, you know, how we're living in a place where most people don't know about Islam, all that type of stuff. You mm -hmm. can explain that from a young age. It's important to explain it at a young age. You can start teaching history early. That is something the public schools are, are, totally um dropping the ball on yeah our, our 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 beloved brother rumed asks how much of any any of the time do kids spend the time online learning when you in homeschooling also is it recommended to set up a computer for them to be on yeah so you know in our family we try to really limit um screen time and the reason we do that is because usually um activity on screens can just be too stimulating right where kids kind of expect that dopamine rush constantly um so we really try to have more books, less screens. Um, uh, the, the less you use screens, the better. I would say don't use it unless you have to. Yes, I'm saying that as someone who teaches primarily online. Mm -hmm. I, gotta, I gotta give the haq, right? The more, the more you can rely on books, the better. The brother says, as I understand it, is it the parents who are responsible for teaching, right? It's not like the kids are assigned to teach it, teach the subject. Brother, it depends what program you're, you're, you're signed up for. You know, if you're having your kids do it online, Mm -hmm. But look, well, what I'll say, brother, with, with homeschooling, you know, if you're going to get into it, treat it like an opportunity. Treat it as an opportunity to 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 let the air out a little bit of the kids' tension from having been in, in, in public schools if they were in this type of thing. And try to focus on building your relationship between you and the kids at, at the outset. You know, even if that means like just, just shutting everything down for a while. And I know this brother a little bit, so I'm... So, so talking to him mm -hmm. but and i just say that brother because like you, you know sometimes parents they want a crutch okay they they they, 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 they want a crutch or something they feel like is a fail safe you know mm -hmm. because of their own insecurity like well i'm not going to do it right so if i have them in this program okay then at least they have that as a base or this type of thing you know don't 
let let go of that uh, is what I uh, advise parents. You know, don't be afraid to just let the air out a little bit and just start building your relationship with your kid. You know, like yeah. like um, that. It's okay to just focus on that for a little while, because really, I think you you want. I, I it seems to me you miss out on a big benefit of the homeschooling if you don't make it about you and your child's relationship being learning focused mm -hmm. and, and being learning learners together and building a sense that they depend on you for, for learning or, or that's, you know, something they get from you, this type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's that, that relationship piece is so important, right? Because it's, the, it's, that is the crutch that you're going to be falling back on later, right? Is the relationship yeah. that you have with your child. LK or IK asks, if a child has no siblings, to what extent should you be focusing on nurturing their social skills outside of home? A lot <laughs> is my opinion on that. I, <laughs> I mean, all kids are different, but I, I will tell you as a teacher, you, you know kids who are single kids. Mm -hmm. you, you know it a lot. Like, like I, I, I personally, I think that self-centeredness with only children mm -hmm. is, a, is a very real issue. I, that's my personal opinion on it. And if you have a kid who is an only child, you should try to get them around other kids or around other people, not necessarily other kids, around mm -hmm. other people yep. and around situations where they don't do not think the world revolves around them. Yep. And they don't think that everything is about what they want or what's going to happen mm -hmm. to them next. Because, uh, you know, like, again, you know, especially when I was teaching elementary school, but even teaching high school now, I can see it like, you know, yeah. when I was teaching, for, teaching fourth grade by the end of the first week, I know kids who were. Yep. Who are only children, like like they stick out. So so I I, I would say don't just look, ignore this. Try to tend to this is what I would say. Absolutely, and you know another thing that I'd add is that you can try to find parents who you feel like have the same values as you. You know because just being Muslim, right? Like it's like that doesn't necessarily mean you guys have the same values, right? So you know let's say that you know you're really trying to follow the Sunnah. Um, you know try and. Um, you know, to lead a, a lifestyle where you depend on what Allah said and what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, right? And, you know, now you team them up with this other family that, you know, celebrates Thanksgiving and you're like, oh man, you know, we were just talking about only celebrating the two Eids because that's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded, right? Mm -hmm. This can be something that, you know, makes your kid kind of confused and, you know, um, it some benefit can come out of it because it can be another opportunity to explain, right? But then the issue that arises is that your kid now might want to do those things before being ready to be exposed to that. No, no. This brother says, Salaam alaikum. I've been seeing Brother Sajid living sharing your posts and videos. Yes, and maybe there's... I got a whole bunch of new subscribers this week because of Sajid uh, 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 playing my stuff. May Allah reward him. I appreciate him doing that. I was thinking, you know, I've been doing these short videos to try, you know, those are the ones on um, how nice teachers patronize Muslim kids because there's so much attention to the LGBT stuff right now, but I'm trying to show people how like yeah. there, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Oh yeah. It's really way more than that. And it's more, and that stuff is more inundated mm -hmm. than, than the LGBT stuff. And, and like, we're not even aware of it. You know, I, I, making short videos, there's always a lot more you want to say. So I'm thinking about doing a stream tomorrow mm -hmm. where I talk more about those uh, uh, videos. And I was thinking about talking about in the context of Sajid's video. And mm -hmm. I was going to call it my reaction to Sajid's reaction to my reaction to school books. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I wonder if I should think? do a reaction. On <laughs> then you can do a reaction to my reaction to Sajid's reaction to my reaction <laughs> on school. On school. <laughs> anyway, I thought that'd be funny. Okay, well, brother, what should we? What what what, what should we? Uh, why why come, brother? brother I, I, thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, let's put your email back up again for the people who are still with us. Much we still have twenty four people. Had over thirty for most of the stream. This was one of our. This was one of my most attended streams ever. Mashallah. I am so tired. I've been up since very early in the morning. Same. And, um, you know, I hope that I hope that uh, people benefited. Abdurrahman.ekar at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. OK, if you still have some questions, consult with Abdurrahman. OK, he, he, will, yeah. he will help you. OK, he's done this, you know, so so, so he will help you. Ekar Ed Coach 
Mm -hmm. Is your social media correct? Yep. And then you could put up the, the link tree thing in the description once the video uploads. That's the easiest. Yes. Part. Okay. The okay. Yeah. Which he's talking about this page right here. We will get that in. Yes. I'll put in the yeah, chat right saying. now. Wayakum. Uh, Wayakum, sister. Uh, please do the closing dua for us, brother. All right. Jazakallah khairan. Jazakumullah khairan, everyone, for coming. Um, you know, this was a benefit to me in seeing your questions, and may Allah Azza wa Jal um, accept our efforts. I mean, subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.